Only has snakes. What is your guys' like biggest fear? Wasps. Wasps. Making a bad happens. movie. It's like <laughs> <laughs> what? What, what was that? Pardon. My biggest fear is making a bad movie. Oh, that's a good one. Who knows? In a thousand years, even you may be worth something. <laughs> Son of a bitch. It's the dying days of World War II. The Nazis are busy looting the great artworks and treasures of still-occupied Europe, and Indiana Jones and his charming British professor sidekick Basil Shaw must infiltrate their operations to steal back the Lance of Longinus, an ancient relic said by some to be the spear tip that pierced the side of Jesus on the cross. Another theory has it that this is the name given to Maura's penis. A third theory states that these are the same thing. Indy battles the Nazis with his hat and his whip and revolver. His British professor sidekick is very British. There's wit and humor in action and just about the right amount of cheese. There's an evil Nazi scientist type with a hat. There's a fight on top of a moving vehicle. It culminates with the Nazis losing and Indian Shaw staring up at a bright dawn. And it all feels a bit like a proper Indiana Jones film. Hooray! And then the rest of the film starts and Indy decides he wants to die. Welcome to Indiana Jones and the Last Jedi, I mean the Dial of Destiny. There's an awful lot to be said about the original and, in a happier alternate universe, the only three Indiana Jones films, about their place in culture, about what they represent, about why they're so popular. And amongst the very many reasons to hate our timeline, well, it's that we've got five Indiana Jones films, not three. The OT are each quite far from perfect, but proof that little charm goes rather a long way and that old simple things are so often more enduring than modern attempts to better them. History is the theme in more ways than one. In terms of genre, they are, of course, callbacks to the serials of the 30s and the 40s. You can find a near-perfect ancestor to Indiana Jones in 1941's Pimpernel Smith, which stars a roguish Cambridge Don and archaeologist who, with a team of students ostensibly on a dig for Aryan treasures, sets his talents and his wits to the task of liberating both past and present from Nazi tyranny. History and morality are bound up together in Pimpernel Smith, just as they are, in a less cerebral way, in Indiana Jones. The only use value Nazis see in history is that which bolsters their present-day ambitions, and they'll destroy and corrupt anything that doesn't. Shakespeare is good, so of course he must have been German. To be or not to be, as our great German poet said. German? But that's Shakespeare. What you don't know? Oh, I know it's Shakespeare. I thought Shakespeare was English. No, no, Shakespeare is a German. Professor Schutzbacher has proved it once and for all. Dear, how very upsetting. The English sense of humor is strange and unknown, and so it must be proven to be what it isn't, unfunny. I am told that the English have a secret weapon, their sense of humor, and I am determined to find out all about it. For instance, P.G. Wodehouse. Listen, the man with the beard sighed. Down in the forest, something stirred. Is that funny? No, it's not funny. Archaeology, history, knowledge, they're not ends in themselves. They are useful insofar as they provide evidence of the Nazis' Aryan origins, and contradictory evidence is smashed to pieces. But this attitude to the past is what dooms the Nazis in the future, because they'll never find the proof they seek. They'll never attain the power and legitimacy they so crave, and so their quest for it can only possibly end with their destruction. You will never rule the world, because you are doomed. All of you who have demoralized and corrupted a nation are doomed. Tonight you will take the first step along a dark road from which there is no turning back. You will have to go on and on, from one madness to another, leaving behind you a wilderness of misery and hatred. And still you will have to go on, because you will find no horizon and see no dawn, until at last you are lost and destroyed." Hubris, as Auden said, comes to an ugly finish. Irreverence is a greater oath than superstition. Alton Nouns put it in colour, add a few more American accents and a bit more action, and you've got the basic plot skeleton and moral message of both Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade. The genius underlying the original trilogy is that it revived history behind and in front of the camera updating a genre, recasting the most ancient and culturally ubiquitous tales. Grail myths work because their symbolic importance transcends the religion that birthed them. We have that cultural memory, to be sure, but it can be put to work metaphorically in any plot reducible to the potent desire for something we don't possess. The Last Crusade is a quest for the literal grail and the figurative grail of the absent father and amended childhood. In losing the cup, the grail is gained. I trust.
almost reach your dad. Indiana? Indiana? The OT is a medley of timeless delights, adventure, action, puzzles, history, romance. Its setting in time, I think never later than The Last Crusade's 1938, lets us revisit one of the most naturally dramatic moments in our collective past. You get the glitz, the glamour, the class, the politeness, the sophistication of an America only recently dead by the time the films came out, and its natural antithesis in the style, impoliteness, and thuggery of the Third Reich. In his dual lives, Indiana Jones uses rugged and uncivilized means to protect civilization from its antithesis, and is arguably a more cultural warrior than even James Bond is, since Bond fights for country when he's not swaggering about in a tux, and Indy fights for antiquity when he's not lecturing about it to the next generation. There's a surprising amount of depth to one of his most famous lines, that belongs in a museum. and I don't know if it's right to say that it's taken on new meaning today, I think it's just become more relevant. The inversion, of course, is that Indy himself is now something of a relic, a cultural artifact, if you like, making him the subject of the line rather than its issuer. Why do old things belong in museums? Because history and nostalgia rely on the same thing, a letting go, a leaving be, that switch in the collective subconscious that manifests in the want to preserve rather than to renovate. Increasingly common demands to lift artifacts from Western museums and return them to their ancestral homes are more of a desire to renovate than to preserve. Lost amidst the tediously ahistorical narratives around colonial exploitation are the fact that historical preservation requires an act of will backed up by resources and learning. The marbles probably were better off in Elgin's indelicate hands than they were adorning the ammo dump the Ottomans made of the Parthenon, much of which was blown up anyway when the Venetians, as only Venetians could, decided to shell it and Indian archaeology began as a purely colonial exercise. It was the likes of Sir William Jones, James Princip, and the Asiatic Society that thought it worth digging up India's forgotten past and translating its fading texts, documenting its undocumented history, and rescuing relics from the long-standing and, it must be said, understandable native tendency to break them up and turn them into new buildings. It's an unpopular fact, but it is a fact nonetheless that Orientalists taught the Orient a great deal about itself, because the West was rich enough to afford the luxury of knowledge. And it's that, by the way, not capitalism, that motivated Indiana Jones. Whatever Phoebe Waller-Bridge might tell you later, capitalism is actually not very good with history, and I speak as an ardent capitalist. Capitalism is the thing that demands new ways to find material profit, and it's instinctively uncomfortable with letting things move from present to past tense. Those old Indians turning ancient Buddhist relics into railway sleepers were arguably more capitalistic than the capitalistic Orientalists like Jones and Princip who rescued them for posterity. And they were much more so than the Islamist or Hindutva nutters who, much like the Nazis, would rather destroy heresy than preserve history. But it's the constant need to renew, to renovate, that seems to have taken hold in our own countries and our own times. Coming closer to the subject of this video, it's the reason we cannot let old things lie. We don't know how to make what our ancestors made. We can only bend their relics into new shapes. Indiana Jones belongs in our metaphorical museum. I think the original trilogy does currently sit in the Library of Congress. But the character himself has been wheeled out and dressed up and recontextualized and generally renovated twice since then, to worse results each time. Someone somewhere believes there's monetary value to be extracted from reusing him, which denies his sufficient value as history. It's kind of ironic, really. Indy wants to rescue relics from those who would put them to new financial and material ends. He wants relics preserved as they are, studied and untouched, not put to heathen purposes, because they've had their day, and no good can come of re-employing them. If, however, you find yourself watching Dial of Destiny and you find your face melting, it's because Disney couldn't help but go to that big old warehouse, find the wooden crate, pull out the Ark, and open it on our screen to our collective horror. Disney are the Rene Bellocks, the Walter Donovans of our world, Philistines, not philanthropists donating treasures to the public. It's doubly annoying in the case of Indiana Jones because I think we were on the cusp of putting him in that museum. Lucas and Spielberg trotted him out in 2008 for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but I think that's commonly regarded as a terrible mistake, much more so than the Star Wars prequels were, since there, the issues rested more with delivery than with intent. There was still a story to be told with the Star Wars prequels, even if George told it badly, while with Indy, the intent seemed pretty much bankrupt from the off. The fact it took so long and so many versions and variations before Crystal Skull arose, and the fact it was seen by most involved as an excuse to get away from more serious projects, all suggest there was no pressing need to add to a story Spielberg himself believed he'd finished with after The Last Crusade. When I was done with Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, there was a reason 
that I invented the shot of Harrison riding a horse into the sunset because I thought that brought the curtain down on the trilogy and then we were all gonna move on and mature into other aspects of filmmaking and I never thought I would ever see Indiana Jones again. The audience too had some desire to see Star Wars return for a seventh installment even after the prequels, while Dial of Destiny has been quite spectacularly unanticipated. The creators couldn't be bothered, the audience didn't much care, the character is still remembered with immense fondness, so... So yeah, I think we'd collectively come to terms with Indy's transition into memory and his placement in the Mind Museum. But we are not Disney. Oh no, Disney is not satisfied. And so, here we are, about to review a film nobody wanted, that precious few have watched, and that, speaking for myself at least, just kind of left me baffled and depressed. I wasn't as angry with it as I remember being with Crystal Skull, but I don't think that has anything to do with the film's comparative quality. In fact, as will emerge throughout this video, Crystal Skull is technically the better of the two reboots, and by quite an alarming distance. But while Crystal Skull was the wrong story for a character who might have had some life left in him, Dialysis Machine of Decrepitude is just an exhumed corpse trussed up and wheeled around the stage. It's embarrassing on its face, and it's despairing underneath. Indy gets the Last Jedi treatment, and that's what we all wanted, right? So, um, yeah. <sighs> With that said, on to the film, I guess. We do indeed begin with the Nazis and their looting under Allied bombardment. A man, bound and hooded, is pulled out of a van, dragged into a castle, and the hood is removed, revealing Indiana Jones! Yay! Or rather, the PS5 version of Indiana Jones, because this is just a prologue and they have de-aged him. It's far from the worst example of its type, in fact it's probably one of the better examples of its type where realism is concerned, it is less rubbery and shiny than other recent attempts at de-aging, less uncanny until he has to speak or make facial expressions, because neither of these things seems quite right. Also, the voice hasn't been de-aged, anything like so effectively. You got a lot of nice stuff. Other people's stuff. It sounds distinctly like ancient Harrison Ford doing his best impression of young Harrison Ford after the three cups of gravel he's had for breakfast every morning. It's just uncanny, the voice and the face don't match. It belongs in a museum. And the expressions, well, sometimes they're almost there, but almost is about as close as we're gonna get. The computerized version tries to approximate several of the faces we are so used to seeing in Deep Pull, but it's just not quite flexible or dynamic enough and they're uncanny precisely because the original is so familiar to us. Harrison Ford has never been the most versatile actor, but the fact his expressions tend to be slightly exaggerated is part of what makes them memorable. Because they're memorable, it's easy to tell when something just isn't quite there. I'm not a doomer about this technology by any means, at least not about its potential. We're what, seven years since Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One? The aging has seen pretty much exponential improvement in that time, and there's no reason to suppose it's going to stop. We're probably not that far from it being indistinguishable from the real thing, which is, hmm, exciting and alarming? Probably more alarming than exciting at this point, not just for us ordinary everyday humans, who at some point are really going to need a much more robust legal definition of, and protection for likeness, but for movie making as a whole. Because going back to the theme we've barely left yet, it makes renovating old franchises just that much easier. Indiana Jones doesn't need to be recast, this doesn't have to be the end, he can go on, and on, and on, and on, rendered into an eternal present by a soulless computer. Yeah, it's actually kind of hard to treat this as a franchise finale when the film itself shows us that it really doesn't need to be. The fate of a film does rest almost entirely on story and writing, of course, but laziness has a great many external causes. It's not that it's impossible to properly revive indie via the computer, but the ease of doing so, of relying on a familiar face to draw the crowds, exerts downward pressure on the important craft that underlies movie making. It will fail in the end because the audience will drift away from empty content as we are already doing, but it'll be a slower death than it might otherwise have been. And in 5 years, or 10, or 20, however long it takes for the studio to waft the stink of this film out of the room, well, what's to stop them coming back and trying it again? Back to the plot itself, the Nazi general asks what Indy's here for, and Indy replies that the Nazis have a lot of nice stuff. Other people's stuff. Or rather, he says, You've got a lot of nice stuff. Other people's stuff. The general says, to the victor go the spoils, and Indy helpfully dates the film for us by replying that Berlin is in rubble and the Fuhrer is in hiding. The Nazis have already lost, which is, well, it's okay. It might be stretching definitions a little bit, 
Hitler stayed in his Berlin bunker during the Siege of Berlin, which isn't quite the same thing as going into hiding, but, well, whatever. It's not hugely important either way. The general demands that Indy be hung, because if they'd simply shot him, we wouldn't have a film, and so he's carted away, and this is when we get our first look at Mads Mikkelsen, who will go on to be the most disappointing indie villain since Kate Blanchett, and probably more disappointing even than her, because at least she camped it up, at least she had some fun. I'm a big fan of Mikkelsen, even if he has played Hannibal in pretty much every villainous role he's taken on since, and there's not much blame to be laid at his door for his character's failings in this film. It's just a textbook example of how not to write a villain, as we will shortly see, and see again, over and over again, in what follows. Mads brings a wooden crate out with him, he opens it to reveal what they'd hoped would be the Lance of Longinus, but which transpires to be a fake. He has, though, found something rather more important than that. Indy, meanwhile, is indeed strung up to be hung, but he's rescued by a fortuitous bomb, as opposed to the unfortuitous bomb that is this film. The bomb destroys the tower they're in, but it doesn't explode immediately, and it leads to what can only be described as a period of excess. The bomb sinks slowly through the floor, then it goes off and the tower begins to collapse. Indy starts hanging, the thing he's attached to breaks, he falls to the floor, he forgets to remove the noose, he falls and hangs again, and then again, and then he finally decides it might be an idea to remove the rope from around his neck. It's far from the worst example of excess in the film, and excess is not a fault unique to this film. <laughs> Come on. Much of what drags Crystal Skull down is the temptation to add more and to go bigger and longer and bigger and more and blow up the spectacle. There's serviceable bits in that film, but when you see Mutt swinging with monkeys and a protracted ant chase and then giant aliens blowing up temples, you think, yeah, hi George, we see you there. Well done. Please, um, please just stop now. Indiana Jones has always had fun with excess, but it used to be limited by budgets and practical effects, and limitations are important even if you're not really aware of them especially important when George Lucas is involved. Crystal Skull had too few limits, and much the same is true of this film. This little sequence, while far from the most ridiculous thing ever, nonetheless prolongs the time we spend looking at a de-aged Indiana Jones, which is unwise for the reasons previously stated. And the fact the excess is so unearned is what makes it seem more irritating than fun. When we realise that technically he has just been hung, as the Nazis planned all along, and somehow his neck didn't break, well, that kind of thing is more forgivable when it's an outlier. It's less forgivable when everything around it is equivalently absurd. The Nazis are meanwhile loading their misbegotten goods onto a train, and they're making ready to leave. And we find that they've captured Indy's obligatory professor sidekick, Basil Shaw, played by the almost always competent Toby Jones, though in this film he fathers Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and that's the kind of incompetence you can't really get away with. He's loaded onto a train with the loot, while Indy, now out of the tower, has donned a Nazi uniform and wound up behind the wheel of a car, replete with Nazi passengers. Because this thinks it's an Indiana Jones film and so it's doing all of the Indiana Jones bits. Disguises, motorbike chases, fighting on top of fast-moving trains, rescuing out-of-place professors, etc, etc. The prologue is trying to be an Indiana Jones film, though, while the rest of the film tries to kill Indiana Jones, and it basically succeeds, so enjoy it while you can. The Nazis on the train proceed to interrogate Shaw, and it turns out they've found Indy's hat and his whip, because, again, this thinks it's an Indiana Jones film, so it has to make a point of him getting these things back. The train pulls off, Indy drives the car as part of a convoy of officers escorted by motorbikes and sidecars, and you know exactly where this is going, but I'm not sure they know where they are going, and why they're not on the train with everybody else already. The film's reason, of course, is that it needs to contrive a motorbike chase, but there's no reason I can think of that Indy shouldn't have immediately boarded the train, as opposed to getting into the car with which he will then chase the train, given the train was still in station and loading as he entered the car. The film's about 20 minutes longer than the next longest entry in the franchise, and frequent interminable chases make up much more than the difference, while being altogether less dramatic because, once again, limits are important, quantity is not the same as quality. Having realised that he really needs to be on the train he inexplicably didn't think to board earlier, Indy takes the car off-road and makes for the train, while his Nazi passengers just sort of flap around a bit in the back seats and don't really make much of an effort at all to stop him. He gets chased by the motorbikes because, hey, remember when Indiana Jones was good? And he destroys them in what can best be described as a cutscene, one where much of the peril just isn't there because you know he isn't really there. There's a lot to be said for actors doing their own stunts, or even the physical presence of stuntman. When Harrison Ford is leaning over the edge of a tank about to have his head smashed in by a rock, there's some tiny part of you that forgets it can't possibly happen, and it adds, well, it adds to the general tension of the scene. Those were the days. I miss those days. 
Back then, your mind could excitedly ask, oh, will Indy get crushed? Oh my god, is he going to get shot? Will he fall off the cliff? While today, that question is, hmm, I hope Harrison Ford can make it up those stairs. He, he looks pretty fragile. Oh no. Oh, please don't fall over, Harrison. You won't get up again. Both of you got to rough up like Harrison Ford a little bit in the movie. What was it like working with him in certain action scenes? Because me personally, like I would be scared to put a finger on him. And then still be able to get up, you know, without putting any bracing on anyone. It just really nimble. That stuff's all for later, though. This is video game India at the moment, hanging off motorbikes and getting punched and shot at by Nazis, most of whom aren't there either, which is uh, where well, it looks silly for other reasons as well. When a motorbike sidecar crashes into a tree, the bike proceeds as though it's not been touched by anything, which it can do because it doesn't really exist and so it hasn't been hit by anything. Harrison wants things to be real. When you're able to keep it real, that feels more visceral for the audience. Then what were your favorite scenes to shoot? Yeah, I loved the adrenaline of doing, of being on a stationary motorbike with rain lashing in my face in a studio with someone dressed in like a green alien suit <laughs> taking my bike behind me. Never been happier. Older films, which also did motorbike stunts, did them with real motorbikes, meaning the stunts are immediately more believable and just look altogether better because they really happened. You can't forget to account for physics when you're crashing real motorbikes because, well, they're fucking real motorbikes. One of the many reasons Indy should have gone straight for the train rather than taking this long and needlessly risky way of boarding it while it's moving is that people aboard might potentially notice a high-speed gun battle taking place outside their windows, which is the kind of experience you can today enjoy riding the L trains in Chicago, or so I'm told, but happily nobody spots him until it's too late. The film shows the train gunners being distracted by allied fighter planes, which is fine in the precise moment he climbs aboard the train, but it doesn't really explain why they didn't spot him before, but never mind. He's on the train now, and he's running along the roof. We get the first notable excerpt of the classic John Williams theme, and it's worth noting it here because we'll have precious little chance to enjoy the soundtrack later. This is frankly a bit of a tired effort by Williams anyway, but the sound mixing is so terrible that you can barely hear it over everything else. The train sequence is just a medley of older themes, really. On the odd occasion, you can't hear it, and I can't remember a single piece of original music from the entire film. Everyone else is phoning it in, but you kind of expect it from a Disney-era Indiana Jones 5. Just call 1-900-990-INDY on your touchtone phone to play the Indiana Jones telephone adventure game. Every caller can write in for a great Indy photo certificate. It's only $2.50 a call. Kids, check with your parents before calling. Hearing Williams phone it in, though, that's just... Yeah, that's, that's kind of miserable. On the train, Shaw is still being interrogated. <laughs> King Soy Professor. Again, a strong performance from Toby Jones. Shame he's not in the film more. This is where we learn he has a daughter, and his daughter will distressingly be in the film quite a lot later on. When asked whether he and Indy wanted the lance for its power, Shaw replies that it has none. They just wanted to save history, and you know what? Yes! It all contributes to the weird sense that the prologue is more of an Indiana Jones film than the rest of the film that follows. Elongate all this stuff, pad it out a bit, and there's a standard Indiana Jones style adventure in all of this. They don't do that, which is a shame. On top of the train, Indy seems notably unconcerned about Shaw. He is looking for the Lance of Longitude. And when he spots it through a skylight, he drops down to grab it. He goes for a stroll through the carriages, still dressed as a Nazi officer, which role he has to perform for the two guards who rise to salute him. They belatedly spot, though, that his jacket has bullet holes in it, and this is not the first time that this has happened in a profoundly mistaken Harrison Ford-related movie. I just couldn't help but notice you're wearing a uniform pocked full of laser burns, so either you heal real quick or you stole it off a dead man. Indy escapes them, he opens the box, he learns the Lance of Long is a fake. Mads Mikkelsen's Nazi scientist, meanwhile, named Jürgen Wohler, interrupts the interrogation of Shaw with the news that the Lancelot of Long is a fake, but he's got something even better than that. He has found the Antikythera, which is fascinating enough for its real history before you add on the bullshit this film adorns it with. In reality, it's the first known example of what you might call an analog computer, a system of cogs and wheels and gears that was able to predict astronomical movements and phenomena like eclipses several decades in advance. It sounds mundane to us, but given it's dated by some estimates as far back as 205 BC, and machines of its complexity are not seen again until around the 14th century, it's one of those things that leaves you marveling at ancient genius, and also wondering just what else was lost and how much further along we ourselves might be today had it not been. For reference, assuming the 205 BC date is correct, that's only around 35 years since Eratosthenes first measured the circumference of the Earth, reportedly by measuring the angle of shadows against poles placed in Cyrene and Alexandria at the same time in the same day. He also calculated the Earth's axial tilt, 
and also to an astonishingly high degree of accuracy, but more depressingly for him, he was one of the earlier famous people in history to be branded a beta male, because though he was competitive in almost every endeavor you care to name, he usually came in second. That though, being a beta male, that didn't get him down too much. Eventually he went blind, and that's what got him depressed, and so he starved himself to death. So there you go, all you beta cucks out there, things can always get worse. I mention all of this because, well, it's more interesting than the film, but also because it's relevant to the film. Keep in mind that each of the OT installments took pop history and myth as their inspirations. George Lucas often wrote the films around the MacGuffin he wanted Indy to go off searching for. There's a wealth of the stuff in Raiders and particularly The Last Crusade, and while it is pop history and innovation and creative license, it still gives you the sense that it's venerating the things it references. You don't need to do all the work explaining the importance of the Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant, because Western civilization has done all that itself over the course of 2,000 years. The things the OT references were tied to the great religions. Judaism for the Ark of the Covenant, a very, very loose bastardization of Hinduism in Temple of Doom, and Christianity in The Last Crusade. I think Fringy made this point on Open Bar, but hey, I'm stealing it. Sorry, Fringy. The first and third of these in particular work because the myths and legends being played with are so common. You don't have to grow up believing Christian to know of the Holy Grail, for example. And by tying these MacGuffins to religion and the supernatural, the films could avoid getting bogged down with technicalities and details. The whole thing is about really not messing with magic and certainly not messing with God. Well, Marcus, we're on the brink of the recovery of the greatest artifact in the history of mankind. You're meddling with powers you cannot possibly comprehend. One of the very many reasons Crystal Skull didn't work anything like so well by comparison is that, though it did very slightly root itself in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, though in reality the Crystal Skulls were almost certainly all European fakes, George wanted the film to be an homage to the 50s and 60s sci-fi B-movies, and so the film dispensed with magic and went in for pretty naff pulp sci-fi. Proof again that George really needs someone sitting over his shoulder to say things like, yes, and there's a reason they were B-movies, George. Squeal! Squeal louder! Squeal! Louder, louder! Squeal! Louder, get down there, boy! Squeal! <laughs> That was a marked departure from the comparatively genuine attempts the OT made to ground itself in established myth and legend. The Isle of Doubtfulness will go on to take an even looser approach than Crystal Skull, because it doesn't really try to root its MacGuffin at all, besides telling us that Archimedes made it so he could do time travel and no, I'm not making that up, but yes, yes, I, I really wish I was. Leaving aside that the actual Antikythera is unlikely to have had much, if anything, to do with Archimedes, because the calendar it's linked to wasn't in use in Syracuse or Alexandria, no real attempt is made to place it within the context of Greco-Roman religion or culture. The film's depiction of time travel isn't the realization of an ancient magic, it's just a convenient and ungrounded mechanic that was somehow discovered thousands of years ago by an ancient Greek mathematician. Which is a shame, because Greco-Roman culture and religion is so vastly rich and in ways we don't often see used in modern media. Eratosthenes was on friendly terms with Archimedes, he was made chief librarian of the Library of Alexandria under Ptolemy. He tried to use mathematical tools to explore Plato's philosophical theories, from whence we get the realm of forms, itself one of those cosmic othernesses of the type an old indie film might have found very useful. Man has to be pulled by chains out of the cave and go into the realm of forms because he loves the shadows and knowledge, the sun, the form of the good, is blinding and painful and terrifying to him. It's arguably an early version of epistemic distance, which basically means you can't see God because if you did, you would explode. Not hard to see how something like that, which references a popular version of genuine history, could be used in a manner similar to the opening of the Ark in Raiders. Dildo of Destiny will go on to make reference to, and then tragically to depict, the Roman assault on Syracuse. And just as tragically, it will depict Archimedes himself later on. And no, it makes no fucking sense at all, but you get the strong sense they went with Archimedes just because they'd vaguely heard about him, and not because they really give a shit about the history of the time or the place, or its vast, proper Indiana Jones-style story potential. So no, rather than the realm of forms or the powers of Zeus or Jupiter, we get Archimedes inventing a dial he didn't invent in order that time travel can happen because fuck it, why the hell not? It's not as though we've got any better ideas to work with, except all those you can list if you spend literally five minutes thinking about it. And the film had to balls up the Antikythera even further in order to have it serve as a MacGuffin. Because quite apart from the fact that the Antikythera was discovered way back in 1901, so it wasn't exactly news by the 1940s, it was found intact 
While this film has decided that only half of it has been found so far, because Archimedes split it in half to stop the Romans getting it even though they got it later. And yeah, we're gonna of course have to go on a quest to find the second half. Oh, and because I know some moron is already in my comment section making this point, no, I'm not saying the OT was big on historical accuracy, I am saying that it took creative license with history. A key word there being creative. This film wants time travel to happen and doesn't really give a shit how it goes about getting it, or indeed what it's going to use it for, meaning it's forced a great big turd into its script unnecessarily when it could have taken basically anything from about 1500 years of ancient Greek history and broken less in order to create a more compelling plot with a more culturally significant MacGuffin. I mean, hell, have them go after a relic of Dionysus that's said to contain incredible power, but that, when retrieved, sends the holder mad. That would be a very loose play on the back eye by Euripides, or some sort of quest that sends them to an undiscovered tomb beneath the Acropolis, or that culminates in a sacrifice on Mount Olympus, just anything, really. Anything that isn't a time travel compass. Or hey, if you are going to use time travel, you could have him go back in time and try and save his son because he's dead now, but yeah, we'll, we'll come to that presently. Fuck it anyway, nonsensical time travel to ancient Greece and Rome is what we're getting. By the slightly strange interlude in which Indy fights to save Hitler, I love this timeline. While Jurgen Klopp shows off his half of the Dial of Destiny to General Nazi, Indy goes running through the train because some inconvenient Nazis have set off an alarm. Now, you will note you can only go two directions on a train, so if an alarm has gone off, he's probably fucked, except that for reasons best known to the scriptwriters, the alarm seems only to have alerted the most recognizably important Nazis at the other far end of the train and the information is not filtered down to the middle where Indy is, or the packed restaurant car in which he's presently sitting, surrounded by Nazis, merrily eating and drinking even as their train gets assaulted by allied bombers. Meaning Indy can just sit down with a tray and wait for the head Nazis to walk past him, because nobody thought to alert the dozens of people he's sitting around that there might be something up, an intruder on the train perhaps. The Nazi general walks past him to the carriage where he previously locked in his pursuers. He unlocks the carriage and then points them back up the train from whence he came, which, well, I mean, why? If you know he's gone past you, why have you gone all the way back in order to get the people in the worst position to chase the intruder to chase him back up the train? Why wouldn't you do a shakedown top to bottom, rather than walking all the way to the bottom and instigating a search from bottom to top? I mean, you walked past him, you moose. With this kind of silly thinking, it's a wonder the Nazis were even able to take France. So Indy makes it all the way back up the train, where he does indeed pick up his hat and his whip and rescues Battle Shore. Only now does Nazi General think to wake up the people in the restaurant car so they can join the long procession back up from whence he came. Fucking spanner. Indy and Shaw go toward the front of the train, where they first encounter Jürgen Klinsmann, and of all the ways to introduce someone you're going to try and make an intimidating villain, having him stand up confusedly only to get twatted by the hero is… yeah. Well, it's a choice. It won't be the first such choice in this prologue. Having knocked out Jürgen, they pinch the dial and continue on their way, while the Nazis they've trapped behind them decide the only thing for it is to climb to the top of the train and chase them from there, though they're interrupted by another random plane attack. Some of this does look slightly impressive, it must be said, just very occasionally, when it's not too weird that you've got a CGI backdrop and a semi-CGI indie accompanying a fully real Basil Shaw. I'm a sucker for World War II nighttime fighter raids and such, but again, it is deployed haphazardly and with the chief aim of establishing a contrivance. They need to find some way to slow Indian shore down, so the fighters take out a Nazi manning an anti-aircraft gun, which of course just keeps on shooting and rotates back to face Indian shore, thereby trapping them. The problem here is that, just a few minutes away, there's a bridge. The bridge is undefended. There are no anti-aircraft guns on the bridge, and the train will have to cross the bridge. Now, I actually did almost take a degree in war studies, but as it is, I did philosophy and ethics, which makes me an expert in pretty much nothing. But with my limited knowledge of tactics pertaining to scenarios like this, well, I would have thought you would not be throwing your planes at the well-defended train when that well-defended train is shortly to go over an undefended bridge. You might take the bridge out first, or hell, you could bridge on the river quiet and take out the bridge while the train is crossing it. Minimal risk, maximum reward, you might think. But at least we get our action scene. Jürgen Habermas has noticed the dial is now missing, so he's obviously going to join the chase as well. Indy and Shaw wait until the gun doesn't move out of their way to run underneath the hail of bullets and climb onto the train to carry on running, only for the gun to then run out of ammo anyway, so fuck it. And they make it a little way before, predictably enough, Nazi General emerges from the mist, holding the fake latitude of longitude. So yay, we get the obligatory fight on top of a moving vehicle. Speaking of which, 
Is it a bit strange that Indian Shore have stayed on top of the train? They know it's being attacked by Allied aeroplanes, and you'd think the top of the train is probably the most dangerous place for them to be. The fact General Disarray here makes it to the front of the train before them, and makes it there alone, means inside would have been safer and quicker. But then, I guess if they'd gone back inside, we'd not have got to have our fight on top of the train, and that would have been a big loss, because this is trying to be an Indiana Jones film, so you have to have a fight on a train, because it happened before. Though, then again... How do they even plan to get off the train? It hasn't occurred to them to jump yet. If they got to the front and if they were inside, they could have stopped it, but as it is, they're on the roof, so they can't do that. Anyway, it looks Jonesy enough in its rare instances where it's not just looking a bit weird. In the way you might play an Xbox Indiana Jones game and think to yourself, yeah, these graphics, they're kind of average. Though it's the second time in just a few minutes that we get some Nazi bastard on top of Indy and holding his head down, ready to get squashed by oncoming scenery. It's the kind of thing that does work once or twice, but if you keep on doing it, it loses whatever effect it once had. It is a classic Indiana Jones style shot, and this part of the film is an homage, so it's using and reusing as many of the classic bits as it can, though again, without really understanding how they work or when, why or how to use them. By the way, when General Disarray emerges ahead of them on top of the train, he is quite clearly armed with a pistol, and he is a good distance away. So how, you might be asking, did they end up in a melee fight? Why hasn't he just shot them? Well, that's because this is a modern movie, and modern movies don't really give a shit about logic. So while he's a long way away, General Disarray advances on our heroes holding the tip of the long of lance, but when he gets within melee range, he loses the melee weapon, and only then thinks that a pistol might be quite a good thing to use, the wally. Indy uses the whip to get the gun out of the Nazi's hand, so we've had that bit, and in case we missed that it was a bit, the soundtrack helpfully reminds us by playing Indy's theme again. Savor it, because he's only going to use the whip about once more across the entire film. Shaw picks up the gun, and accidentally grazes Indy with it, and here is a very fine example of the deficiencies of the de-aging. Because I know exactly what the computer is trying to generate here in terms of facial expression, but it's just not quite got it. Shaw eventually gets it right on the second attempt. Indy kicks General Disarray off the train. We get a nice shot of Allied planes dropping parachutists off, though the film is about to locate us in the Alps. I'm not sure I recall an instance of a Market Garden-style parachute drop in the Alps, but never mind, maybe there was. Unfortunately, though, we're not yet done, because Jürgen Kohler climbs the side of the train, and he picks up the gun and demands they return the Antikythera to him. Indy throws a bag at him, but then he dies. <laughs> I, I mean, no, Jürgen is dead. He, he's completely dead. They're going at high speed, and he's just been hit in the head by a huge metal beam from the side of a tower. <laughs> Jürgen Vogel is dead. He is not recovering from that absolutely no way. So, so that's the end of the film, right? Yay, we, we can go home. Not too much damage done? Nah, sadly not. The Allies do what they should have done earlier and they bomb the bridge, but Indy and Shaw jump off and into the river below before the train crashes and suddenly it's, it's bright daylight. Um, okay. I know they've just got half of a time travel compass, but it's only half. It's not working yet. They haven't used it. So, so where did all the missed hours go? How is it suddenly daylight now, film? Not sure about that one. We learn that the bag Indy threw to Jürgen's spa vassal was a dud, and he's still got the dude of dicks on his person, so good-o. He's gonna put it in a museum, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's what he's going to do. He and Basil walk off. Somehow the train has already been completely overtaken by British paratroopers in the same time it took them to jump off of it, and that's the end of the prologue. The rest is considerably worse. It might even be more accurate to call this the end of film one, because there are at least three or four films in here, and the rest of the film is entirely different. I think they were consciously trying to ape the device at the beginning of Last Crusade, with young Indiana Jones transitioning into present-day Indiana Jones, but that was actually clever, closing as it did with a direct tie into the present-day story, while on this occasion, we are arbitrarily jumping several decades forward and into misery. On balance, Film 1 will probably emerge as the strongest of the three or four films we're reviewing here, because though it was a soulless homage that lacked any of the heart or much of the talent on display in the OT, it did at least understand the basic ingredients of an Indiana Jones adventure, while the rest is, as mentioned, pure and unadulterated sad. It had the feel of one of those comics adventures that I've not read but I'm vaguely aware of, stories that are recognisably Indiana Jones but probably not quite worthy of the big screen. At worst, the prologue was Indiana Jones fan fiction. It's full of issues, of course, from the mundane, like in the pointlessly going for a car instead of straight to the train solely to manufacture a motorbike chase, but the rather more serious, like the fact the villain it's about to reintroduce is, must surely be, dead. The MacGuffin misdirect is also a bit of an odd choice. 
because it voluntarily adds a vast slice of luck into the mix. They've gone for the lick of Lesbos, which is a fake, but luckily Mads Mikkelsen popped up at precisely the right moment on precisely the right train, with the definitely not fake Destiny's dial to make the whole thing worthwhile. As an introduction, it's a toss-up between this and the Crystal Skull, for which is worst, and now I see that in my script I realise that's the most obvious fucking statement in the world. I would say on balance, this is slightly better than Crystal Skull, only so far. Having Indy captured on a mission to retrieve a known MacGuffin is not quite as convenient as having him kidnapped off screen and taken to an incomprehensibly unguarded warehouse containing the actual Ark of the fucking Covenant by Russians who've somehow learned there's also giant alien heads in there. Somewhere that you know, have psychedelic god that fucking film. Again, this one plays on more familiar beats, so even if it's quite a hollow simulacrum of older films, it's not entirely worthless. Yet, I don't think stumbling across the most important MacGuffin in the film by accident is an especially strong start. All the OT films begin with mini quests for incidental MacGuffins teasing character traits and motivations, and then building to the search for MacGuffin Prime, ensuring that MacGuffin Prime's arc begins with mystery and problem solving in general setup, rather than it being fortuitously thrust into the hands of our protagonist. Indy going after the golden icon in Raiders, for example, is presumed to have done all the work required to get him there, while young Indy's attempts to stop the evil people making off with the crucifix in The Last Crusade establishes his veneration for history and his hatred for those who abuse and exploit it. Having MacGuffin Prime just handed to him by accident does not, by contrast, tell us anything we don't already know it is just lucky. I believe that's also the longest introductory action sequence of all of them, which is the film tipping its hand fairly early on. Expect a lot of drawn out action sequences that eventually lull you into a drowsy tedium and a comparative deficit of slower build up. And it's such a depressingly obvious thing to say, but it has to be said because so many films these days just don't account for it. Pacing is important, guys. Proper pacing keeps the audience engaged. You entice them in with mystery and suspense. You provide catharsis with high action, you maintain interest by dropping the pace again. Lingering too long on either provides differing flavors of boredom, but boredom either way. That 20 minute opening action sequence was starting to drag, and it is only the opening 20 minutes, but, but, at least boredom is better than sheer misery. And, uh, yeah, that's where we're going next. We jump forward in time to 1969 to discover that Indy has become Mr. Plinkett. He's an old boozer who falls asleep in his chair and can't really be bothered to dress himself anymore, and he's rudely awoken when some youths start playing loud music. Because Indy is old, he leans out of the window and tells them to turn it down. Because he's old. D did you miss that? I, I said he's, he's really old. He's old as fuck. He does old man things because he he's an incredibly incredibly old man, in case that wasn't clear. He's so old, he still calls people of color colored people, I bet. He doesn't like young people or loud music or the present tense or even his own existence. And what's that you say? You like Indiana Jones because you want in some way to be him? Because he's cool? Because he's suave and sophisticated but also strong and athletic? And he's funny? And he goes on epic quests and adventures and fights Nazis and such? Indy's symbolic of a happy time, of fun, of daring do, of peril, epic quests, action and romance? Well, you can roll that up tight and push it so far up your ass that it comes out of your mouth because you're wrong. That's not what Indy is about. Not anymore. Indy is now about the pain and struggle and tragedy of growing old. Indy is about arthritis and dementia, zimmer frames and depression. You thought you wanted to embody Indiana Jones? Well, here's the result. Pain and suffering, aching limbs, creaking bones, a hatred of everyone and everything around you, a hatred of the person inside you. That is what Indiana Jones is now. Wait, wait, where, where are you going? The movie isn't finished yet. Old man Indy is especially annoyed because the youths are playing loud music at 8am on a work day, but he's snootily told he should turn on the news because it's moon day, you see? Indy doesn't know this because he is a man out of time. He hates the future, he has no time for the moon. He makes himself some coffee, and we get a lingering shot on the divorce papers Marion has sent him, which leads him to put a fridge magnet over the photo of her he keeps on his fridge. Now this is not abysmal on a technical level, though it is suspiciously convenient. How long have the papers been sitting there? Why hasn't he already covered up her face? Why does he only think to do this now that the camera is on him and the film needs a quick visual way to convey what's already happened? The fact he lingers so long on both of these things, papers and the photo, suggests it's the first time he's really given either of them very much thought. He goes over to the fridge for no other reason than to put the magnet over the photo. The film is trying to adhere to the show don't tell maxim, but it is showing us didactically. It's showing us in the most telling way possible. A slightly better way of showing his current state of mind might have been for him to go to the fridge to get milk for his coffee and adjust the magnet, which is only half covering Marion's face, since that would convey the same antipathy while also showing us that this has been hanging over him for a while, make it a half thought 
thought gesture as opposed to a first time thought. Despite it being moon day, he does in fact still have to work. So he catches a subway and looks disdainfully at a child wearing a space helmet. He still works at a university as a lecturer, but in nothing like so prestigious a setting as we're used to seeing him in. His apartment is smaller and shoddier, his workplace is smaller and shoddier, and his students have gone from being the upper crust of academia to the stodgy base of an old and rather cheap microwave pie. Because the film wants to convey as quickly as possible, and in as many ways as possible, that this man is dead inside. Until this point, we've seen him lecturing at fictitious Ivy League schools, elite institutions teaching the elite, or at least the children of the elite. It's always been a small but definite part of Indy's glamour and his charm. His character is lent grandiosity by the grandiose settings of old established institutions, in much the same way Harry Potter takes on additional magic by having Hogwarts present, as for all intents and purposes, an ancient and elite British private school, eaten but with magic. This is all part of Indy's aspirational nature. It makes him, and the world he inhabits, seem delicious, something completely desirable. You want to be him? You want to be taught by him. You want to go to that school. You want to learn there. You want to be at his lectures, and the lectures of his prestigious colleagues like Marcus Brody. You want to fuck him. Indy, that is, not, not Marcus. It's a world of high intellect, of oak panelling, of crystal tumblers, cigars, and expensive brandy. It's Indy's equivalent of Bond's swanky dinner parties, all tuxedos and martinis, high stakes gambling in exquisite fashion. It's used to make Indy himself desirable as a character to inhabit while also juxtaposing his rugged adventurer demeanour. He would be half the character without all of that. And in this film, he doesn't have any of that. He doesn't even have the adventure. He has none of his old character. In Depths of Despair, he's teaching at a distinctly downgrade Hunter College in New York. No confirmation, by the way, if it's the same as the real Hunter College in New York, but if you're an alumni of that institution and you liked your time there, well, I hope it's a different one because this film suggests you're kind of a brainless moron who's basically uneducable. Remember how in his first lecture in Raiders, Everyone is hanging on Indy's every word. They're fascinated, and many of them also fancy him. This lady, for example, is not just hanging on his every word, she is salivating at the prospect of hanging on his cock. In this film, though, it's the precise opposite. Nobody wants to be here. Everyone's bored. No one can answer even simple questions he poses them. And he doesn't really seem to care that they can't. He forlornly tries to cajole them with threats about subjects appearing on their final exams, but they just don't give a shit. And he knows they don't give a shit, and he doesn't really give a shit himself. He casts no spell anymore. He's been thoroughly reduced. And it's worth keeping count of the ways, by the way, because we're about five minutes into the film's main time period, and so far he's getting divorced, he lives in a shitty apartment, his hippie neighbours don't respect him, he boozes and sleeps semi-naked in an armchair, he doesn't even begin to care about the moon landing, he finds people around him strange and threatening, he teaches at a shit school and no one wants to listen to him, and he doesn't really give a damn about his own subject anymore. Say, does all this remind you of anyone? Go away! Only one person in the auditorium seems at all interested in what he has to say. Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who begins what will be a constant trend throughout this film, by already knowing the answers to every question he could possibly ask, these at the moment revolving around Archimedes. It's worth noting, by the way, that the film is botching its fictional as well as its real-world history. He describes Archimedes, his trade, his skills, his inventions, and notably absent from this impressive record, is any mention of Nazi warplanes and dragons. Well, says you, obviously. Why would any of these things be on Syracuse in the 200s BC? Hmm, that's a very good question. We'll answer that later. But Indy then asks what physical evidence there is of any of the preceding, any of Archimedes' deeds or his inventions. And Phoebe Waller-Bridge pipes up with the Antikythera, which, well, uh, no. The Antikythera has very little, if anything, to do with Archimedes, it would seem, at least from real-world scholarship. But even if you accept that this film's Archimedes invented and made the Antikythera, how does its existence stand as evidence of the siege of Syracuse? How is it evidence that, as Indy recounts from real-world history, Archimedes invented sun lasers and giant anti-ship lever claws and things? Could it be that it doesn't do any of that, but the film needs a speedy way to reintroduce the MacGuffin? Yeah, 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 I think that might be it. Anyway, we won't dwell on that because the film doesn't either. Some students wheel in a TV from somewhere, showing that the astronauts have returned, and so that means nobody will pay any attention to Indy anymore, no one cares about history, the class is over. Indy slouches off to the staff room for his retirement party, where cheerful colleagues give him an ornamental clock, which he immediately hands off to a homeless man outside because he doesn't give a shit about anything and so he doesn't give a shit about the clock or his colleague's affection either. He doesn't give a shit at all. He's just depressed. He wants to go to a bar and get drunk. Now, it is clear what the film is trying to do, which is, well, kill him, obviously, but specifically, 
It wants to drive home Indy's general out-of-placeness by reiterating over and over again his disdain for, or at best, disinterest in, the most dramatic event the modern world has to offer him. He doesn't care about the present. The present has nothing to offer. It's not that his life is in the past, but rather that he believes his life is past, which is a distinction with an important difference. Because there's nothing necessarily wrong with having Indy disdainful of the present. His father was, in a way, disdainful of the present. But the important difference is that his father had a compensating passion, because to him, history was alive. But this version of Indiana Jones doesn't have that love to counteract his hatred or, at least, his utter lack of passion for modernity. Now, I'm usually insufferable enough, but, um, but that, that's, that's up the level. Let's dial this up to 11. Let me regale you with a poem, because... Let's face it, we all know I'm a pretentious git, and if you didn't at least accept that, you wouldn't be here. But don't worry, it's not one of mine. It is W. H. Jordan's. I used the line earlier. And I'm going to use it because it references the exact same antipathy Indy has toward the exact same event, the moon landing. But it shows how you can balance that curmudgeonliness with a positive and lively vision. The poem itself is called Moon Landing, and it goes... It's natural the boys should whoop it up was a huge phallic triumph, an adventure it would not have occurred to women to think worthwhile, made possible only because we like huddling in gangs and knowing the exact time. Yes, our sex may in fairness hurrah the deed, though the motives that primed it were somewhat less than menschlich. A grand gesture, but what does it period? What does it us? We were always adroiter with objects than lives, more facile at courage than kindness. From the moment the first flint was flaked, this landing was merely a matter of time. But ourselves, like Adams, still don't fit us exactly. Modern only in this, our lack of decorum. Homer's heroes were certainly no braver than our trio, but more fortunate. Hector was excused the insult of having his valor covered by television. Worth going to see? I can well believe it. Worth seeing? Nah. I once rode through a desert and was not charmed. Give me watered lively gardens remote from blatherers about the new, the Von Brauns and their ilk, where on August mornings I can count the morning glories where to die has a meaning, and no engine can shift my perspective. Unsmudged, thank God, my moon still queens the heavens, as she ebbs and falls, a presence to glop at. Her old man, made of grit, not protein, still visits my Austrian several with his old detachment, and the old warnings still have the power to scare me. Hubris comes to an ugly finish. Irreverence is a greater oath than superstition. Our apparatniks will continue making the usual squalid mess called history. All we can pray for is that artists, chefs, and saints may still appear to blithe it. This, imperfectly but essentially, is the Henry Jones Sr. attitude to life. It's disdainful of the most momentous event modernity had to offer, but not because it has no love for the world. It's the idea that life is something more than progress, that history and art and culture and good food matter more to a certain person of a certain disposition at a certain age than technological wizardry and the advancement of science does. Why clamour for the latest royal sleaze in Prince Harry's new book? Why watch the BBC for the latest rumblings about Ukraine when you can read Chaucer and watch Casablanca instead? It's a sentiment Douglas Adams identified in his own way in The Salmon of Doubt when he laid down his rules for technology. Number one, anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and it's just a natural part of the way the world works. Number two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Number three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. All this is relevant because the thing so many people are complaining about when it comes to Indy's character in this film is that it has been thoroughly and efficiently and even cruelly destroyed. There's nothing about him that's lovable or kind or even especially sympathetic beyond that pang of depersonalized guilt you feel when you see a lame animal that really needs to be put down. It's what makes this film so soul-crushingly miserable, and unnecessarily so, leaving aside for a minute the way it seems to conflict with what we know of Indy's character. If you did want to keep the essential beats in play, if you did want to have Indy in something like this condition and set of circumstances, you could have done so while showing that he still lives, he just lives backwards. Have the loss of Marion and Mutt, on whom more presently, combined with age and retirement leave him disenchanted with the present, but have that manifest in an exclusionary interest in his field of study. Have him disinterested in his colleagues, his students if you want, modernity in general, but have that disinterest shown via an obsession with books and scholarly learning and, if you want, whiskey. You'd accomplish a few things with that. Most importantly, Indy would be less pathetic and slightly more recognizably and endearingly himself. You could feel sorry for him, but you wouldn't necessarily pity him or even mourn him, which is what the film seems to want us to do, dead man walking that he is. Secondly, but relatedly, he'd be recognizable not just for his old field of interest, 
but for the way his obsessions have become myopia and cost him present-day relationships. In other words, Indy would be familiar for the traits his father showed in The Last Crusade, which has a nice poetic ring to it. Thirdly, it plays in well with what we learn later about Basil Shaw and the way his obsessions finished him off, at the cost of his daughter, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Helena Shaw. It would give her a justifiable reason to dislike, or at least to disdain Indy when they meet, because she would see in him the same faults that cost her her dad, which would have the added bonus then of placing her in a similar position to Indy himself was in The Last Crusade, which itself could be paid off by having Indy eventually see that similarity. For a franchise that affects to care so much about history, this would be a way of accomplishing what this film wants to accomplish but better, and with a clear regard and respect for the themes of family and history the franchise has long been known for. It would still pose problems, because the film seems to be overemphasizing the conclusion of Crystal's skull, Marion was forced into that film, having spent most of the preceding out of his life entirely. Indy didn't even know he had a son until midway through that film. It's the loss of that son, and so the loss of that wife, that's said to have defeated him utterly in Dialysis Machine of Decrepitude. But I'm kind of forced to ask, would it really? If Crystal Skull ends in 1957, and this film is set in 1969, and Mutt's death happens some time ago, he would believably have had less than a decade to really come to know these two people, having lived without any shown or professed need for them for the remainder of the 70 years of his life. Me. What's your mom's name again? Mary? Mary Williams, you remember her? We're a lot of Mary's, kid. Shut up! That's my mother you're talking about. The film will go on to suggest, and again I'll come to this more fully later, that Mutt joined the army to spite Indy, suggesting that, of that less than a decade, they spent even less time on good terms. Indy's personality was formed by the seeming absence of his father. Did I ever tell you to eat up, go to bed, wash your ears, do your homework? No, I respected your privacy, and I taught you self-reliance. What you taught me was that I was less important to you than people who'd been dead for 500 years in another country, and I learned it so well that we've hardly spoken for 20 years. Absence and loss are not new to him. If anything, they contributed to the lively and headstrong independent character we remember from the OT. So tragic though his present condition undoubtedly is, you do have to put in some deliberate charity to accept that the reversion to the norm, as far as he's concerned, him being alone, should have impacted him so heavily in this film in ways they've never been shown doing before. Would he be sad? Well, yeah, obviously, but would he be defeated as he is in this film? Somehow I doubt it. Anyway, back to the misery. Indy leaves to go to a bar and get drunk. He's followed by Helena, who is in turn followed by a suspicious lady who will shortly learn works for the CIA. And also the Nazis. Maybe? Yeah, yeah that's, a whole, that's a whole other thing. Just bear with. We have more Phoebe Waller Bridge before we can get to that particular mindfuck. Helena follows Indy into a bar where he is indeed getting pissed while watching more footage of the astronauts. She introduces herself, he moans about the moon, she asks if he recognizes her. He replies, whatever I did, I apologize. Don't mind that as a line, that's kind of funny. She presses him though and tells him her name, Helena, Helena Shaw, affectionately called Wombat for some reason. And Phoebe Waterbridge doesn't look particularly like a wombat. Actually, she does. She is a strange character, this Helena Shaw, or rather, well, she's an incredibly irritating character, but her characterization is peculiar. Mauler pointed out on EFAP that Phoebe Waterbridge always seems so very aware that there's a camera on her. He's at a bar, drinking his fucking troubles away, because I'm sure he does a lot of that with this iteration and this era. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, she's like, you don't recognize me, do you? And he's like... Uh, no, sorry, you're annoying. Please go away. Of course, it's, <laughs> so, it's been 18 years. <laughs> then she's like, hell to sure. And, and I was just like, oof, fuck. And you get this throughout the whole movie. She is so aware a camera is on her at all times in this fucking oh, film. Yes. yes. Yeah. She Ugh. can't, like, no offense. I haven't seen her in the thing everyone likes her from, apparently, or, or the thing that made her get somewhere. Was it Fleabag, people keep saying? I've never Fleabag seen it. And Killing Eve as well. I think. But holy motherfuck, like, every time the camera's on her, she plays to it. She's like, <laughs> oh, ooh, oh, oh. She, <laughs> To me, she was Marvel as a person, like, current Marvel, just in oh, the film. God, yes. Oh. Oh. Um, she never recognizes the tone of any scene. She's just doing whatever the fuck she wants. She came up via Fleabag, a show with frequent fourth wall breaks, and where the audience is always supposed to be in on the joke, which is the style Wallabridge seems never to have fully broken from. It's not hugely apparent yet, it will become more evident and so more annoying later. But the problem with this ever-present nudge-wink characterization is that the audience she's playing to isn't of her character's era. We're all sitting here in 2023. She is supposed to be in 1969. 
yet her character sits awkwardly between the decades, and very often says things or acts in a manner completely unbefitting the film's time period. I mean, keep in mind, this character didn't even grow up in the 60s. As we see later, she was 12 years old in 1951, the last time Indy saw her and her father. She was born and brought up in Oxford and would have been in her 20s by the time 1960 rolled around. The swinging 60s were an immensely transformative decade, especially as you approach the Soissons Wittard generation, transformative and polarizing because the pace of change came as an affront to the large conservative rump of England. Those who did their growing up in the 60s might as well have belonged to a different country to those who had already grown up by the 60s. Add in the fact that Helen the Shaw's father was a fusty old academic and if anything, you'd expect her character to be rather less modern than the time period the film is set in. But as it is, she seems far more modern in her mannerisms, her speech and her behavior even than the 1960s types we glimpse as mise-en-scene throughout the film. Which all adds to the impression that she's been sent back through time to appear in Dial of Doomcock. She never ever feels like she belongs in any scene she's in, which is highly inconvenient since this is much more her film than it is Indy's, as we will see going forward. Mercifully, we cut away at this moment to some Nazis, because yes, Nazis are still around in the late 1960s and no, it makes precious little sense. A black waiter is bringing food to the hotel room of an important guest, a Mr. Schmidt. The room has four people in it, besides our waiter friend, two distinctly goonish looking types, a man on crutches who we're told broke his ankle somehow, and Mr. Schmidt himself. Ed Goon, played by Boyd Holbrook, whose character name I genuinely don't know, so we'll just call him Boyd going forward, he informs the waiter, You don't need anything on wheels, put it on a table. Um, <laughs> okay, so he's to put the food on the table. What? That's a bit of an odd thing to say, Boyd. What does Mr. Schmidt have against wheels? Do waiters usually leave room service trolleys behind them when they leave? Wouldn't you assume the food will be put on the table? The line's baffling because it doesn't lead anywhere. We never learn why Mr. Schmidt so dislikes things on wheels. It doesn't have any impact at all on his character. It just sounds dumb as fuck. The only reason I can think of to include that line is external. It's that the way to clearing the papers off the table is the director's chance to zoom in on the papers, showing the Dial of Destiny, which the waiter has to move before he can put the plates down. But again, you'd expect him to put the food there, and you'd expect him to clear the table first, and so you don't need to introduce Mr. Schmidt's fear of wheels, because, yeah, it still makes no fucking sense. And the film misses a beat here, because if you'd not primed the waiter with these unnecessary instructions, you could have had him move the papers unbidden of his own accord and been rebuked for that, or at least cause some sort of alarm on the part of Schmidt and his goons, because they're things that the waiter shouldn't have seen. That would have been a much more natural way to stress the importance of those papers and the information they show. It could even have been a tense scene, at least for a moment, because you aren't yet supposed to know exactly who these people are. They're meant to be undercover. And you could have teased their true nature pretty easily in the manner I've described, and much less clumsily than the reveal we actually get. Mr. Schmidt is staring at a window with his back to the room, and he turns around to reveal that he is, in fact, Jürgen Wohler. He survived. Somehow. He survived being twatted off a fast-moving train by a solid metal beam. Which is already bullshit, but let's run with it. Surely, though, surely that's gonna leave a mark, you'd think? Surely he'll be badly disfigured. Maybe brain damaged. At any rate, bitter and unhinged. Oh no, never mind. He's completely fine. Didn't leave so much as a scratch. So, uh, yeah, we, we can add that to the long list of missed opportunities with this guy. Because you could have much more effectively portrayed his transition from his younger, more bookish self to his villain form with a great big facial disfigurement. I mean, really, he should have no head, but, you know, he probably needs one. The franchise has history with disfigured bad guys. Major Arnold Tott from Raiders of the Lost Ark famously has the medallion scorched into the skin of his right hand and is generally a slightly greasy, deformed-looking guy anyway. His villainy has the sinister creep factor to it, and if anything, he's the closest OT approximation to Jürgen's character in this film. He's not a physical specimen, he's not an action villain, he's not intimidating for his size, but rather he's calculating, he's methodical, he's someone whose evil comes from his scheming, his willingness to torture, and his control of a useful looking set of grunts. Like Jürgen, Tart is introduced early on in pursuit of a MacGuffin. Like Jürgen, he suffers a setback, and like Jürgen, he reappears later in search of the same MacGuffin. But unlike Jürgen, his introduction casts him as a man to be feared, showing us what he's capable of and what he's prepared to do, which makes his return later on a threatening proposition. 
He carries the scars of the first encounter, and the unspoken question is, well, if he was that evil back then without cause, how evil is he going to be now that he has a revenge motive on top of being a Nazi? He's very rarely in Raiders, but he carries a significant presence into every scene because, though it's simplistic, his introduction is handled well and his nature is firmly established. Jürgen, by contrast, is in this film much more often and he carries no threat and no menace because he's never been shown to be competent or threatening. He never will be shown to be competent or threatening and the film can't even be bothered to give him something so simple as a visual indication of his revenge motive because he bears no scars, despite having been hit on the head by a metal pole, traveling at, what, 80 miles an hour and then falling off a train? Also moving at that guard, yeah. No, he, he's just dead. He shouldn't be here. The film does try to inject a bit of threat and menace into his interactions with the waiter, but it's, it's comically overdone, whilst at the same time being mysteriously underdone. Seeing that the waiter is black, Jürgen asks him where he's from. The waiter says he's from the Bronx. Jürgen asks where his people are originally from, and the waiter looks at him slightly awkwardly and suspiciously and says that he was born by the Yankees Stadium. Jürgen asks if he fought for his country, he confirms that he did in Normandy, which is where the exchange really should have ended, maybe with a look of disdain and disgust on Jürgen's face, because by this point, we've got the point. We remember who he is from the first scene, we know he's a Nazi, the music tells us he's evil, we know the Nazis are evil racists, we know he's having to conceal his true feelings about this black man who symbolizes the victory of everything he hates. It's not just that the Nazis lost, it's that they lost to the people they consider to be their genetic inferiors. But uh, yeah, that, that's not where the exchange ends. Because modern movies generally think the audience needs to be smacked in the face with subtext harder than Jürgen tanked that metal pole. So Jürgen continues. He asks, and I quote, Are you enjoying your victory? which is met with no response. Then, when the waiter asks him if he wants anything else, Jürgen signs off with, You didn't win the war. Hitler lost it. Uh, you do, um, you, <laughs> you do remember you're supposed to be undercover, right, Jürgen? You do know you can't just go around in America in 1969 saying, Hey buddy, hey guy, I'm a Nazi. B because, you know, sure, the US government had a use for you, in this telling, it's Jürgen, not Werner von Braun, who built the rockets that sent man to the moon, because, you know, fuck history. But it took a dim view of scientists brought over in Operation Paperclip going around propagating overt Nazi propaganda. Paperclip was a very tricky operation, morally as well as practically, because the scientists were assets that were going to go somewhere as the Nazis retreated, whether to help the Japanese or to help the Soviets, or worse still, the French. They couldn't just be left to fall into the hands of the enemy, present or future. But their use value didn't entail free reign to continue espousing Nazi ideals on American soil. Paperclip scientists were interrogated on arrival in the US sometimes for several months and were strictly monitored for any illegal activities or untoward thoughts. Their movements were strictly limited. Their freedoms were kind of non-existent. Several were investigated for their alleged involvement in Nazi war crimes, including Werner von Braun himself. And even if you believe that in some instances the investigations were deliberately fudged, in order to keep the scientists in gainful employment, the US government didn't put up with anyone going around being an actual practicing Nazi in America. Ah, says you. But maybe the government just doesn't know what Jürgen's really like. Maybe, even though he's just blurted out the fact he's a Nazi to this random waiter, they haven't picked up on it. Maybe they weren't paying enough attention. Maybe they just conveniently forgot to listen when he called random black people subhuman scum and pined for the good old death camp days. Um, except of course that in this telling, He's currently working in direct liaison with the CIA and the CIA men in the room with him as he's saying all this to the waiter. I know the CIA isn't the nicest organization in the world or even very competent at its evil, but even they know that you can't really be racist in public. I am not tragically colored. As a daughter of immigrants, I am perfectly made. I am a woman of color, I am a mom, I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Wait, you're in charge? I did not sneak into CIA. Misguided patriarchal ideas of I am proud of me, full stop. Oh my God, she's still going. I stand here today a proud 
first-generation Latina and officer at CIA. And that is very important to mask your nefarious nature by marching at pride and pretending like you're good people. Wait, why is there a drone outside my window? I'm back now. My reprogramming was a complete success. Are you looking for a rewarding career opportunity with opportunities for international travel and the most extraordinary renditions, I mean views? The CIA is recruiting. Sign up today. By the way, absolutely nobody in this room is at all concerned about keeping their cover intact. Quite apart from the fact that the world's most obvious henchman is openly cleaning his guns as the waiter walks in, and quite apart from Jürgen standing at a window as good as yelling Wir müssen de Juden ausraten to anyone who'll listen, as the waiter is leaving the room, the CIA guy on crutches, crutches guy, he has no name, he doesn't matter, he gets a phone call and yells, my field agent, she found sure, and they all pick up their guns and go to leave. So what exactly do they imagine the waiter will say when he gets back downstairs? Does he just say nothing to his colleagues or his wife back home? You know, because if I were in his position, I think I might at least have mentioned to someone in passing that there seemed to be secret agents and an evil Nazi doctor in the room upstairs. It's not like it's an everyday thing, you know, it's kind of notable. Back with Indian Shaw, and she informs us that she recently graduated from Oxford and is now researching her doctorate. Special subject, the MacGuffin. Her dad had loads of journals about it. He told her he and Indy found it on the train and then lost it in a river. She knows where the river is so they can go find it and be famous. All of this is a lie, by the way. She tells Indy she doesn't remember their last meeting, which, as we'll see later, saw Indy take the dial from Basil, which would already strain credulity because she wasn't a tiny child at the time. She was 12, and the flashback we see later clearly shows her present as Indy takes it. It also shows Indy seeing that she is there. And anyway, her dad couldn't have told her they'd lost the dial and compiled reams of detailed notes about it. She says if they find it, she can become famous and he, Indy, would get to go on one last adventure, back in the saddle and out with a bang. But you know, you no, know, no, no, we already have that, darling. It's called The Last Crusade. This film is the equivalent of punching an old man in a care home and stealing his stuff. Don't play this, this sordid little game with me. He doesn't need this adventure. Indy asks why she's chasing the thing that drove her father crazy, and she asks, wouldn't you? Because remember, you know, he did the thing in, in the old-timey movie. Remember the old-timey movie? We're masochists, so we're inviting the comparison. The thing is, it's all an unnecessary lie. She wants Indy to lead her to the dial. She knows he has it. The most compelling part of her lie is the bit that comes closest to the truth. Returned goddaughter wants to reconnect, is studying archaeology, studying the dial specifically, knows her dad gave it to Indy, has a particular interest in it because of what happened to her dad, wants to know if Indy would let her have a look at it. It's only done because the film wants to make it very, very clear that she is a liar, that she's untrustworthy, that she has ulterior motives. But in doing so, it misses the opportunity to have a much more dramatic revelation of the fact. If she goes with the much more believable and seemingly true story about her motives, and Indy shows her the dial, and that's the moment she steals it and runs off, we, Indy and the audience, get the shock of betrayal. It'd be a much more powerful scene than the one we get, because everyone already knows she's a lying piece of shit. We don't begin by trusting her, only to have that trust thrown back in our faces. Instead, the whole thing is telegraphed way in advance, so we already know to expect what comes next. It is a general problem with this film. It doesn't actually want us to feel particularly involved in it. We're supposed to sit back in our seats and watch familiar things paraded on the screen one last time. We're not really supposed to immerse ourselves in the story to feel alongside the characters. The Heart of Destiny is an almost entirely meta experience, more so even than Crystal Skull, which was itself quite a meta experience. And it's entirely unlike the OT. Outside the bar, black CIA woman meets up with Nazi goons, and again, I have questions about all this. Why exactly are they working together? We find out later that the US government isn't especially interested in Jürgen's quest for the dial. The CIA are just there and going along with it until the script decides it can't really remember why they're doing it, and then it yeets them without further explanation. And the Nazi goons themselves are a peculiar duo, because, well, are they actually Nazis? They have American accents but German names, and they seem altogether too young to have fought in the war itself. We're in 1969 now, we're 24 years out from the Nazi surrender, yet these guys can't be much older than their mid-30s. Even if we reach and say they're 40, that would put them at 16 years old on the day the Nazis surrendered. So what were they, Hitler Youth? But then, why and how did they end up in America with Jürgen? Are they American neo-Nazis? But then, how did they meet Jürgen? 
Didn't the government notice that their Nazi scientist was hiring his own private security team? Why and how do these people exist? The film generally has a peculiar relationship with its Nazis. The decision to use Soviets in Crystal Skull was a conscious one. Lucas and Spielberg decided they couldn't just ignore the Cold War, and even though the Soviet interest in the occult was much less pronounced than Hitler's, they did have some interest in the paranormal, which made the premise, well, still, yeah, still quite shit, but not entirely unsubstantiated. Wrongly, in my view, the Soviets don't occupy the same place in our collective conscious as the Nazis do. They're not as closely associated with unambiguous evil. Though their kill count was significantly higher, and they ate almost all the Nazis' worst tendencies, if the Holodomor wasn't enough, Stalin was planning a holocaust of his own shortly before he died. But the fact is, the Cold War is seen as a messy one full of moral ambiguity and political intrigue. And Lucas himself isn't as clear on the demerits of communism as he is of Nazism, and that all made the Soviets in Crystal Skull a less compelling and universally understandable threat. This film seems to have tried to correct that mistake by resurrecting Nazis, but Lucas and Spielberg were right not to ignore the Cold War. If you're going to set a story in 1969 and not even hint that that's going on, well, yeah, you're straining credulity. And then the film goes on to undermine the moral clarity presented by its Nazi villains anyway, by having the CIA involved with them in an entirely pointless way. It would have been much more compelling, and it would have been much easier to reconcile with the time period had you portrayed Jürgen and a sinister cabal of friends maybe infiltrating the CIA, using the newly empowered Cold War agencies against the homeland, but that's not what we get, so we're forced to ask, well, what's the fucking point of all of this? And how can you so reliably pick the worst of all the options you have, film? CIA lady ignores the Nazi goons to report to Crutch's guy, who is her CIA superior. The Nazi goons decide they can't really be bothered to wait, so they walk off toward the bar, refusing Crutch's guy's orders to stop, because, as he helpfully points out, they're not his agents. Uh, fine? CIA woman goes after them while Crutch's guy says he'll pull up a file on Indy, because the film has apparently forgotten that Indy worked for the government just a few years ago, and so nobody besides Helena has apparently bothered to link him to Basil Shaw already, which is dumb, because, you know, they're tailing Helena, they know what she's after, they know she's Basil's daughter, which ought to make tailing her unnecessary because they should already have pursued Indy because of his known connection to the Dial of Fucking Destiny, you might think, but, but no. Say, remember Crystal Skull? Remember how it portrayed the FBI's McCarthyite paranoia? Remember how they pretty much immediately hauled Indy in to be interrogated? Because though they're wrong, they're at least semi-competent at their jobs? Yeah, yeah, I remember. God, Crystal Skull. Comparatively competent film. Indy, meanwhile, takes Helena back to his university, to the archives there. This is uh, Indiana Jones, by the way. The guy who believes ancient relics belong in museums. The guy who, as we'll see later, took the dial from Basil and ignored his request to destroy it because, you guessed it, he said it belongs in a museum. Well, happily, he's just kind of left the dial in his desk drawer all these years because, you know, if he hadn't, the film probably wouldn't work. So he retrieves it and he shows it to Helena. He explains that Archimedes created it to predict the movements of stars and planets and also storms. Then, <laughs> to, use, <laughs> to use the film's phraseology, he, um, he, and I quote, he stumbled on a way to predict even larger disturbances. I mean, uh, yeah, just lol. Hey, remember when you were fiddling with your car engine that time, trying to work out why it was making that weird noise, and then you accidentally stumbled on a way to open a portal into hell? Shit happens, I guess. And it's such absolute bullshit. You didn't have this problem with the OT because the MacGuffins were always relics tied to the supernatural. We never had to ask how man could have imbued the Ark of the Covenant with magical powers because man never did that. You don't fuck around with God because you will very quickly and very divinely find out. The point of ancient magic is that it cannot be understood, and attempts to understand it are a potent mixture of foolishness and death. The film itself says that the Antikythera is remarkable because nothing like it is seen again for a thousand years, but notably, nothing invented between the 12th and 14th centuries could predict fishes in fucking time. So, in fact, no, nothing like it has ever been seen, either before or since. The random Swiss guy who made the first clock did not accidentally discover a way of predicting the location of time portals in the fucking sky. Archimedes wanted to do astrology and somehow by accident invented a device that could predict fishes in fucking time? And the only way to answer all of the- uh, no. No, the only way to answer all of the thousands of questions that arise from this is just to not ask them in the first place, because it's just an Indiana Jones film, guys. It's not meant to make sense. Just open wide, 
open wide and consume the creamy white product from KK's Dick of Destiny. Indy tells Helena all of this, by the way, and from look on her face, it's the first time she's ever heard of any of it. Because she doesn't actually want the Dahl for any symbolic or educational or metaphysical time traveling purpose, no, she wants it just to sell it for petty cash to pay off gambling debts and such. I mean, yeah, genuinely, that's her motive. But the film will also take care to tell us later that she's memorized most of her father's journals, so this can't be the first she's hearing of it. Because both she and Indy know that this is the obsession that drove her father mad. So he's telling it to her as though they both don't already know all of it, solely because the audience has to be lubed up for the time travel segment toward the end of the film. And no, no, let me tell you right now, no amount of lube can prepare you for a fuckstick of that magnitude. CIA woman and the Nazi goons have followed them into the university, however, and a couple of Indy's work colleagues come across them. CIA woman does a terrible job of lying, which is entirely unbelievable, because if there's one thing a government agent is reliably good at, it's lying to you. So Boyd shoots them because Jürgen told him to leave no witnesses. How? How is this allowed to happen? The CIA is right there with you. Crutch's guy comes up the elevator and says, what the hell? And, and yeah, what indeed is the hell going on here, film? And quite apart from there being no reason for the CIA to be working with Jürgen anyway, there's absolutely no reason at all why they should be allowing Jürgen's private henchmen to go around killing innocents against the express orders of the CIA. Only the CIA is allowed to do that. But naturally, despite being both surprised and pissed off that the goons have been killing people that they're not supposed to, nobody in our by now quite large contingent of CIA agents decides that maybe it might be a good idea to stop them, so besides registering mild disapproval, they just go along with it for the sake of the script. Indy, meanwhile, is explaining that Basil Shaw also found a legendary tablet, the Graphicos, which pretty much just means graphic, because the film couldn't be bothered to come up with an actual historical MacGuffin. The Graphicos is the MacGuffin that leads to the MacGuffin. It's like the dagger in The Rise of Skywalker. Apparently, it can point to the location of the rest of the Dial of Destiny, the other half of it, that is, and also to Archimedes' tomb, which is several different flavours of no, all bound up together. They know, and the film has already explained, that Archimedes broke the dial into two pieces, but put on the same ship, the ship that sank, from whence one half of the dial was retrieved in 1901, meaning it's already known where the shipwreck is. Anyone, at any time, could have gone back to the site where the first half was found and grabbed the second half. Also, who wrote the Graphicos? Archimedes couldn't have known where the ship would sink, so he couldn't have included that information himself, but the Romans didn't know where Archimedes' tomb was, so they couldn't have written it. And I'm pretty sure no one is supposed to have survived the shipwreck, so no sailor could have written it. And the Graphicos is a Greek word, not a Latin Roman one, even though the ship carrying the dial was a Roman ship. Who wrote this shit? Helena gives the lie away when she says, I knew you wouldn't destroy it, revealing that she did remember the night that Indy took the dial. Not that it matters, because that part of the lie only serves to telegraph the fact that she was lying, but before we grapple with that realization, they are interrupted by the CIA Nazi coalition, the Axis of Dick, if you will, and Helena runs away. Here is the first of several occasions where she deliberately and unnecessarily tries to get Indy either captured or killed, because she closes a gate on him and traps him with the Axis of Dick, and she runs away across the rooftops. Here is also the first of several occasions where Indy himself is just too old for the action sequences he's been placed in. As he waddles desperately around, looking confused, trying to find a way past the axis of Dick, doing the Biden shuffle, looking equivalently secure on his feet, which is to say, like his hip could give out at any minute. He's neither competent nor assured he could have a fall at any moment, and these are not the kind of stakes you want in an Indiana Jones action sequence. It worked with Henry Jones Sr., because the film very deliberately made it a dynamic. He was the old adventurer well past his physical prime, but at his intellectual peak. The film took care to avoid putting him in any unnecessary action scene, letting him be cerebral while Indy himself did the running and the fighting. The film knew, Henry Jones Sr. knew, what his physical limitations were, so both managed to avoid embarrassing him by pretending he could do things he so obviously could not. I've said it before, and I will say it again, that Indy should have been consciously put in a similar role in this film. But that can't happen when he doesn't have someone younger and fitter to do the running and the fighting for him or when his nominal sidekick repeatedly tries her best to ditch him and get him killed, rather than help him. So he's left just waddling around, straining to tip over bits of scenery to keep the axis of Dick away, struggling to run up some stairs, getting cornered. At one point, CIA woman slowly and kindly says, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones, we're not gonna hurt you. Like she's 
trying to talk down a fucking desperately angry and confused old man with dementia who can't remember who his nurses are, or where he is, or why there's that brown liquid in his pants. Indy doesn't so much push over a big shelf full of antiquities as he kind of falls into it and knocks it over, and it squashes Crutch's guy, so we'll neither see nor hear from him again. He's dead. Still have absolutely no idea who he really is, or why he's on crutches, why he's really here, why he's in the film at all. Maybe he was more important before all the reshoots destroyed his future, but as it is, he's just a bizarre and inconsequential nobody. I don't even know his name. Rip Crutches, I guess. Having ridden the bookcase down, Indy waddles off, while well, we get a quick cutaway to Helena on the roof who is also waddling, because whatever qualities Phoebe Waterbridge allegedly has, athleticism is surely not one of them. It would be really convenient if we hadn't killed mud off screen, wouldn't it? But nah. Indy stumbles across the bodies of his former colleagues, which is a scene I think we universally quite liked when reviewing it on EFAP, and that in turn is evidence of how meager the pickings are in this film, because the praise amounted to, it's nice that he reacted to the deaths of those people we saw in that one scene, kind of believable. At least he didn't ignore them. And that's, um, and yeah, it is nice that he did that. And it is believable that he'd do that. Not least because, hitherto, Indiana Jones films have largely kept his two lives separate. The gunfights, the Nazis, and the violence are part of adventure, and the Academy is an undisturbed haven of knowledge and antiquity, peace, and civility. Here, then, is one life intruding on the other, with tragic results. The deaths of innocent scholars who never stood a chance. And that's all fine, except that we don't know any of these people. And Indy's all already been shown not really liking them that much, and this university's previously been deployed as evidence of Indy's fall from grace. It's not portrayed as something he values. It's nice seeing that he feels remorse, that deep down he thought these people were basically harmless and mostly inoffensive, but I think it would have been more effective had they represented something more valuable to him. Had the guns and the goons come to one of the old Ivy League universities? Had we clearly seen that this was the new world intruding on the old, rather than one bit of the new world intruding on another bit of it? Indy then goes to call the police to report the murder, but remember, he's in the same building as the axis of Dick. At most, he's a couple of corridors away from the people who are chasing him. He's just seen another bunch of them, running in the opposite direction. You might think he'd have wanted to get quite far away, establish some real distance before he thinks to call the cops. But if he'd done that, he'd not have been captured, and the film needs him to be captured right up until it decides it doesn't really need that at all, so fuck it. So Indy picks up the phone, he calls the cops, he reports the murder. Only after he's done all of that is a gun pointed at his head, which forces him to end the call. We see him leave a bloody handprint on the receiver, which will be important, kind of, because for about 10 minutes the film has it that he's been framed for these murders before it once again forgets all about that. And it is yet another stretch. Quite apart from him stupidly phoning it in from mere feet away from the people chasing him, rather than running to safety first, we're meant to believe that the police believe that a decorated war hero, former spy and government agent, known academic Indiana Jones, who himself reported the murders, is responsible for the murders he himself reported from the scene? Really? It would be clunky at best set up for his running from the law. It could have been partly redeemed had his status as a fugitive actually impacted the plot in any way, but it doesn't. It simply doesn't feature again. It's never resolved. It's entirely forgotten by the close of the film. It's all just kind of silly. It does enable the axis of Dick to capture him though, which is, in turn, rather silly. Because they put a hood on his head as they lead him out of the university, only to take it off again as soon as they get in the van, which has windows that he can clearly see out of, meaning these people don't really understand the point of putting a hood on someone. It's like if I were kidnapping you from your house, and just ignore that doorbell, you've got another few minutes, it would be like me putting a hood on you as I led you to your front door and then taking it off again as soon as we got out of the house, which would be entirely fucking pointless, wouldn't it? Why bother with the hood film? Helena escapes. CIA woman, who is currently alone on the roof with Boyd, calls him, a noted Nazi and so presumed militant racist, a trigger-happy cracker. Trigger cracker. And um, you might think that the first half of that insult would preclude the second half, no? Like, if he's trigger-happy and he's also a Nazi, maybe calling him a trigger-happy cracker is a dangerous thing to do. It's also funny because it means the black CIA woman uses more racial slurs in the movie than all the actual Nazis combined, which is, but politely, incongruous. The axes of Dick, though, have Indy captive, and they put him in a van and unhood him, as you do. One of the name the CIA agents hands CIA woman some documents and says, here's the file on Jones. And, and they got this from where exactly? Is there a local CIA file depot somewhere? It is funny watching incompetent writers in the internet age try to recreate a very much pre-internet world. They just can't fathom how much slower and more cumbersome things were back then. Crutches said about five minutes ago that he'd go and find Indy's file. In that five minutes, he somehow went, 
found it, retrieved it, got back, and got killed. I do wonder whether in an earlier draft of the script or even an earlier version of the film, they actually took Indy back somewhere to interrogate him, since that might have explained the hood, and it would have made obtaining the file seem some way more believable, but never mind. This is one of those movies where demands to release the director's cut are met with the response, um, which one? The fan makes slow progress because there's a Moon Day parade going on. In what can only be described as a logistical fuck-up of nightmarish proportions, there is also an anti-war march going on, down the same street, at the same time. But hey, it's not like the US government was concerned with parade security in 1969. I mean, Kennedy won't be assassinated until six years ago. This does allow time for a brief interrogation, as Indy asks whether the axis of Dick is CIA, and Boyd replies, Not me, man. I don't take over no jobs. You are a Nazi. Yes, you do. Nazis quite like the state, you fucking pillock. CIA woman asks Indy if he'd met with Helena to give her the dial, even though they just saw her steal that, and even though, if they'd actually been investigating the dial, which apparently they have, they should already have interrogated Indy, but what the hell, it's just a film. Stop asking questions. The van gets stuck because the Moon Day Parade slash anti-war march is still on, and apparently nobody thought to check the route. It tries to go back, it reverses into a taxi, which makes the taxi driver very angry, and rather than force the taxi to move, or shoot the driver and move it, they decide the only thing they can do is get out and walk through the parade. And no, by the way, shooting the taxi driver on a side street next to a televised parade is not a stupid idea. Not by this film standards, because Boyd is about to start shooting guns in the middle of the anti-war march. Oh, <laughs> fucking, yeah. But, but we'll get to that. Indy decides to start chanting, Hell no, we won't go, as he's led away through the anti-war march, which prompts the protesters to start chanting it as well. And this is just a peculiar scene, because you might think the obvious thing would be for Indy to rile up the protesters who see this old man being dragged away by people who are quite obviously the feds, which leads the protesters to try and free him, which causes a ruckus that allows him to escape. That would be pretty neat, fairly simple and sensible. But um, but nah, that's not what happens. For some reason, the crowd chanting, hell no, we won't go, annoys Boyd, who is a Nazi, who has no stakes in the Vietnam War. If anything, he might be quite happy to see that the next generation of Americans are lily-livered, pussy-footed hippies. Boyd has no real reason to be offended by the chance. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like shouting at smelly hippies as much as the next guy, but unlike Boyd, I actually do have a reason to. He doesn't. Yet it's while he's busy shouting at demonstrators against a war he doesn't give a shit about that Indy elbows him in the face and makes a waddle for it. And then Boyd, in the middle of a huge crowd, in the middle of a huge city, in the middle of fucking America, where there's such things as cameras and newspapers that exist, and lots of armed people around, you might think. No, Boyd just shoots his gun up in the air and makes everyone duck. I mean, for fuck's sake. What does he expect is gonna happen here? Why are these secret Nazis so very fucking loud all the time. It's also evidence of one of this film's unwise departures from the formula of earlier entries, including The Crystal Skullfuck. Each of the previous four films took care to avoid trampling on actual real-world history in ways that work against the suspension of disbelief. Events in previous films are private, secretive, they're removed from prying eyes. The only people to witness the Nazi procession with the Ark are those involved in it. It's all set very far away from civilization. It can't intrude. Nobody else has a clue it's even happening. And that all aids the suspension of disbelief, or at any rate, it doesn't harm it, because all manner of things happened in the past that nobody was around to witness. But this, this is very different. This is a major anti-war rally following a major Moon Day parade in a big and real American city. These things, in fact, occurred. We know they occurred because tens of thousands of people were there, and millions more read about them in the accounts of journalists working for newspapers or watched about it on the television. We know Nazis didn't shoot up anti-war marches or Moon Day parades in New York in 1969, because if they did, it's reasonable to suppose even the New York Times might have noticed that. So while older Indiana Jones films can be slotted pretty much seamlessly into the actual historical record, this film can only be an alternate timeline, an old history, a different but similar universe. And it's all so needless, it works against suspense, as well as the suspension of disbelief. It works against mystery. It makes fiction offend reality. And the only reason any of this happens is because the film, just bear with me on this one, because the film thinks it would be fun to have Indiana Jones ride a horse through a war protest slash Moon Day parade while being chased by a Nazi on a police motorbike, because by the way, despite an actual gunshot having just gone off mid feet away, the police are still just standing around gormlessly as though nothing had happened. Indy steals one of their horses, Boyd twats one in the face and steals his bike and we're off. 
And as if that weren't all kinds of dumb, we have to crank the action up to max. So, Indy and Boyd go racing through the Moonday Parade in front of all the cameras. Big Henchman actually steals a car from the parade itself, hauling presumed important dignitaries out. Not that anybody thinks this is at all worth writing home about. CIA woman somehow keeps up with them despite being on foot. Indy rides his horse down into the subway, still chased by Boyd on his motorbike. He rides the horse into the subway tunnel. He rides the horse at an oncoming train. He hops onto the other track before he gets smacked by it. He gets chased by another subway train. Then he gets off on a platform, hands the reins to a stranger and says, hey, hold my horse. What the fuck am I watching here? I know Indiana Jones are always a little bit over the top in their action scenes, but you know, that's part of the charm. But there's over the top and then there's leaving the atmosphere entirely and crossing into intergalactic stupidity. Horses, I should add, balance quite a high degree of natural intelligence by being incredibly scared of pretty much everything. They get scared of their own shadows. They've even been shown getting scared of their own farts. My dad was walking in the countryside a few weeks ago, rounded a corner. Quite a long way down the trail, a horse spotted him and decided the best thing to do in the circumstances would be to fall into a bush. I absolutely refuse to believe you could ride a horse full pelt at an oncoming train and survive. Nope. It's, it's not going to happen. I don't accept it. Stop this insanity. Thankfully then, we go back to the Nazis. Jürgen is giving an interview to one of those journalists who didn't notice any of the proceeding. He's asked what's next now that he sent man to the moon. Going to Mars, maybe? Jürgen replies, no, we've conquered space. No, you haven't, Jürgen. No, going to the moon is not conquering space. You don't go to the moon and say, well, we've done the whole space thing now. Achievement unlocked. What the fuck are you on about, Jürgen? He's prevented from answering the follow-up what's beyond space question, though, by an aide who tells him he should get his suit pressed because he's going to meet the president. And I'm looking on this scene a little bit more fondly than I did in the first instance, because at first glance, it's really just an excuse for a mild quip. Jürgen says if the president objects to a few creases, perhaps he should find himself another physicist, which is fine, all fine, kind of Hannibal-y, in fact. The reporter asks if he can use the line, the aide says no, Hannibal says yes, and looks enigmatically around. Not rip-roaring stuff by any means, but it is serviceable as a quip. But I think the real point of the scene is unusually subtle foreshadowing, which is probably why it's so easy to miss given this is a film where Nazis on motorbikes can chase 80 year olds on horseback through parades and into metro stations. The idea, I think, is to show that Jürgen has already, in effect, checked out of this timeline. He doesn't care about offending the president or the reporter quoting his offensive remark because he believes he won't be around to suffer the inevitable rebuke. His mind's on the dial. If he gets the dial, it's not so much that he disappears from history, but that this history disappears. So he feels at liberty to run what would otherwise be significant professional risks. I think that's actually pretty good as far as foreshadowing goes. It's a crying shame it's foreshadowing one of the worst finales in recent memory, but this one precise bit of setup is tactfully done. Even though we could ask why he went to all the trouble of actually putting a man on the moon when he could secure his presence in America with significantly less work, we might then suppose that by making himself invaluable to America, he's been able to secure the support of the CIA in his quest for the dial, though that doesn't really work because the CIA evinces precious little interest in the dial, and will later say that they don't really need him anymore anyway because he's already given them what they wanted, but hey ho, details, details. He gets a phone call from CIA woman informing him that his goons messed everything up. Shaw has the dial, she and Indy have escaped. CIA woman urges him to cooperate by going to meet the president to get his medal, almost as if she knows that he's about to change his plans, even though he hasn't done that yet. The original plan was... wait, well, what was the original plan? To trace Helena to Indy, where she'll get the dial, then to capture them and get the dial? But if that's so, why not just trace Indy directly and get the dial from him? The capture was the plan. Jürgen informs his aide that he's expecting a delivery soon, which I'm sure means the dial, and it's only after he's been told the capture failed that he books a plane to Morocco instead. We'll learn later that he'd originally struck a deal with Helena to get the dial in exchange for lots of money, so presumably the capture attempt was a double cross, or a double cross of a double cross because she's not going to give it to him anyway, and he knows she's going to an auction in Morocco now. I mean, nobody else, including the audience, knows this until later. But then, even assuming he does somehow know that's where she's going, does the CIA woman? We might assume she's just guessing he might try and take matters into his own hands and is just vaguely warning him off. But even making that assumption, she pointedly reminds us, and him, that she's a representative of the US government and she is urging him 
to cooperate. But then, as a representative of the US government, she shouldn't have to urge him to cooperate because she works for the fucking CIA, and they'd have no trouble preventing him from booking the private plane he needs to take him to Morocco, so... So no, really? All of this is quite messy. Anyway, we're moving on because we have an exciting cameo arriving. Indy, who for these precious few minutes really is on the run, having been framed for the murders at the university, which we know because he's standing at the window of a TV shop watching the news reports telling the world he's a wanted man, gets accosted by a stranger. The stranger recognizes him from the TV and starts shouting, only to get shot in the eye with an arrow by Lando Calrissian. No, 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 sorry, that, that was the other Disney Lucasfilm fuck fiesta. No, he gets socked in the jaw by Salah. The killer! The killer! Sorry, I'm late, Indy. Bridge traffic. Remember Salah? Salah's great. So glad he's here to partake in this catastrophe. Salah's introduction isn't quite as bad as Lando's because it's at least implied that Indy called him for help, while Lando was just chilling out in the desert for several decades waiting for people he doesn't know to show up. But the effect isn't dissimilar. The director, James Mangold, explained the absence of short round in this film by saying he didn't want to go in for the worst kind of forced cameo, unlike all the other cameos he forced into the script in the worst possible way. Kinda like this cameo, in fact. Salah's presence as a New York taxi driver is explained because Indy helped get his family to America during World War II before the vile rat Colonel Nasser stole Egypt from my people and the traitorous Ike torpedoed our rightful crusade to get it back. Though I can't help but note that this well-documented connection between them should make Salah's home unsafe in the long run because surely any competent investigation of Indy's crimes will eventually need the police here. Good job nobody in the film is competent, I suppose. Besides being a pleasant cameo, Salah's role in the script is as an exposition dump to move the plot forward as quickly as possible. There is no Google in 1969, but happily, by virtue of his being from over there, Salah has the ability to automatically know anything and everything that goes on anywhere in North Africa, which is how, having had Indy's plight explained to him, he's immediately able to give us this huge info dump. He recites from his vast wealth of Arab head knowledge. Dr. Tota Helena was arrested in Tangier last year for auctioning contraband. She was bailed out by Aziz Rahim. Aziz Rahim is the son of Big Rahim, a well-known Moroccan mobster. Big Rahim owns the Hotel Atlantique in Tangier. And this week, the hotel is hosting its annual auction of stolen antiquities. All the big players are already there. Gee, how very convenient. So this means that Salah already knows that Indy's goddaughter is involved with foreign mobsters who steal and sell antiquities and, and what? He just didn't think to tell Indy about this before now? I mean, it's a lot like these two have a history of traveling to just such places to stop just such people from, oh, never mind. Indy tells him he needs a ride to the airport and Salah says that if he runs, he will be assumed guilty. Indy replies that without Helena or the dial, he'll be framed anyway. But I mean, well... No? Maybe? No? Wait, what? How? Neither of these things helps your case, Indy. A dial nobody knows or cares about, and the word of someone you've just been told is a mob-connected criminal? Someone who is, moreover, your goddaughter? What about either of these things helps prove your innocence? The only people who could do that are the CIA, once they've left the axis of dick and stopped helping the Nazis for no justifiable reason anyway. It's an awkward situation, and the only surefire way to get out of it is if the writers are somehow to forget all about it by the end of the film. But they're paid lots of money to write scripts like this, so I'm sure that won't happen. Happen. Salah asks if Indy has called Marion. He says no, so off we go to the airport. And no, I'm not even skipping over anything here. That's just how the film is. Once at the airport, Salah hands over Indy's hat and his whip, which he got from Indy's apartment that, for unaccountable reasons, isn't being watched by the police. Salah also says that he bought his own passport. And in isolation, the little speech he gives now about missing the desert and the sea, missing travel and adventure, is really quite nice. Indy, I, I miss the desert. I miss the sea, and I miss waking up every morning wondering what wonderful adventure the new day will bring to us. The problem is that you can't take it in isolation because it's part of this film and the film carries on immediately afterwards, so having heard this impassioned offer, Indy scoffs. Salah says he could help, and Indy replies disbelievingly, In Tangiers? Um, yeah, were you not in the previous scene where Salah told you exactly what had been going on in Tangiers for the last year? 
and what's happening right now and where? Did you forget the guy's really well connected? That he can still handle himself in the fight? That he speaks Arabic? That he's helped you in precisely the kind of situation before? And that he really, really wants to come? Indy then replies, This is no adventure, Zala. But it is Indy. It, it is an adventure. You're going to Morocco to fight Nazis and retrieve a mystical ancient artifact. What about this is not an adventure? Everything about this scene and its setup implores that Salah go with Indy. But he doesn't. He wants to go. He should go. He'd be incredibly helpful if he went. But no, he can't go. So he just hands over Indy's stuff and shouts, Give him hell, Indiana Jones! By the way, in case you were wondering, the film has already forgotten about the manhunt it introduced a couple of scenes ago. It's forgotten that Salah warned Indy about the manhunt in the previous scene. Salah knows Indy is a wanted man, so you'd think he might have stopped himself from yelling Indiana Jones in public at an airport for everyone to hear. But then again, the trail is needed content, so that's what he does. You might also wonder how Indy hopes to get past a passport check, but never mind, he's on the plane now. On the way over, Indy reads Basil Shaw's notes, spotting a curious set of dates that'll definitely become relevant later. Then he looks to the window, which is our cue for a flashback to another de-aged Indy and a distinctly mad Basil. Basil now believes Archimedes discovered a temporal meteorology, a uh, time weather, just, just run with it, and considers this so devastatingly huge in its consequences that he has no choice but to destroy the dial. Though conveniently for the film, he's waited until Indy arrived to try and destroy the dial, even though the film takes care to tell us that he's had this belief for quite a while, so why hasn't he done it already? Fuck knows. Indy says he never should have given Basil the dial. It belongs in a museum, so he should give it back. Basil says that if he gives Indy the dial, it has to be destroyed. And look, I mean, Basil is quite clearly mad, but this has the hallmarks of sloppy writing rather than deliberate madness. Indy has just said the dial belongs in a museum. Basil has just tried to destroy it himself. Why would he give the dial to the guy who says it belongs in a museum and then ask him to destroy it? Surely he should be madly, maniacally intent on doing that himself. Wouldn't the scene have been stronger? Wouldn't it better explain why Indy and Basil never meet again? Wouldn't it better explain why Helena doesn't like Indy? If Indy had fought Basil and stopped him destroying the dial, and taken it away then by force. That would break the friendship, that would break the man. That would be pretty powerful, I'd say. Having Basil hand it over and just drop out of the script with Indy telling young Helena that he'll get better in a few days is just, is just weak sauce, despite Toby Jones doing his usual excellent work on the acting level. And what does it say about Indy's character, who, remember, has presumably not yet gone through the trauma of losing both Mutt and Marion, that he should just grab the dial and leave his friend and his goddaughter in clear distress? He's in a positive hurry to leave. And this is the last time, before the events of this film, that he sees or speaks to either Basil or to Helena. I think you have to break that friendship thoroughly in order to, paradoxically, make Indy's heartless actions in any way redeemable. Have him snatch the dial away from a thoroughly mad Basil in a bit to protect him. Have Basil scratching and clawing trying to get it back like Gollum with the ring. Leave Indy no choice but to leave the house. Otherwise, though, you're just gonna accidentally imply that Indy is, in his own way, equivalently obsessed with the dial, even though we already know he's just going to dump it in a desk drawer and forget about it for several years. Helena, by the way, is also on a flight to Tangiers with the other half of the dial. Not sure what she's been doing in the interim, but as we all know from modern movies, because it happens all the goddamn time, everything off screen is just kind of paused until the plot catches up with it. If anything, you're lucky if these events re-enter the script and they're in the right order, as we will see later. Despite being on the plane at, as best I can recall, the exact same time as Indy, by the time he he arrives at the hotel, she's already there, and she's well established, and the auction is in mid-flow. As so often, it's a very simple fix, you just get rid of the scene of her on the plane, and imply that she left much earlier. Done. And my rates are much lower than your average Hollywood screenwriter, so if anyone's hiring. Despite this being a known mob-connected auction of stolen antiquities, the sole guard stationed at the door is this film's discount short round, whose name is Teddy. But since that is a shit name, we shall call him Tall Square. I complimented some foreshadowing stuff earlier, here is its antithesis. This is violative foreshadowing. Tall Square is sitting at the door to the auction house, surrounded by makeshift dials and levers, learning how to fly from a drunk pilot who just happens to be sitting at the opposite table. What does he do with all this stuff on the 99% of occasions when a drunk pilot isn't sitting at the opposite table? Fuck knows. Are they showing us this because the film wants him to fly a plane later? Yeah, you can bet your wife on that. 
How does Helena hope that this small child could stop anyone at all from entering and disrupting the auction? Absolutely no idea. Why doesn't the mob that owns the hotel protect the hotel? Dunno. Why don't any of the rich and powerful criminals at the auction have their own security? Likewise, do not know. It all looks nice enough. They've picked a lovely location, the kind of characterful, colourful bar you'd expect to see in an Indiana Jones film, and it makes for a very nice change from all the green screen shots that clutter the rest of it. Bit of a shame we're not going to be spending much more time here. Indy does at least saunter past Tall Square without being put in his place by a small child, though that's only to get put in his place immediately afterwards by Helena, who continues to do her best to be as unlikable as possible. She's one big walking put-down. You know, I, I really wanted to keep her, you know, upbeat and joyful. Sorry. I'm the back off. I just told him to shoot you. The only thing worth believing in ever is cash. And I resonated with her. There's such a... It's such a gift when you read a script and the character makes sense to you and you also feel like, oh, I can do this. Like, I know for some reason I feel connected to this person. How did you end up like this? Flaming, resourceful, daring, beautiful, self-sufficient. And I resonated with her. She's incredibly smart and I resonated with her. There's something about her that is not completely connected to real life and I resonated with her. Um, and I really didn't want to like call him like, I didn't want her to have to call him like an old guy or like use any of those kinds mm. of insults with him. And I like the hat by the way. Makes you look at least two years younger. Nice. Yeah. I don't need morality lessons from an aging grave robber. Did you know the Wright brothers? Oh, I thought maybe you went to school with them. <laughs> Oh, come on, Indy. That was funny. She doesn't see people in that way. <laughs> I like your hat, by the way. Makes you look at least two years younger. And I really don't know who, besides people with, frankly, appalling taste, is supposed to resonate with this sort of thing. Who's it for? Who actually likes it when people talk like this? Once or twice, maybe. Marion herself does it in Raiders, but Marion has rather more to her character than snappy one-liners. I mean, she has a character to begin with. She has softer moments and harder moments. She's got that endearingly strange mix of the damsel, the femme fatale, and the heavy drinking boozer about her. Her characterization is in large parts very masculine, which is what makes her more interesting than a mere pretty object. There's a reason, of all the Jones girls, she's the one who keeps getting wheeled out for these cameos. I like Marion. She's a really good female character, unlike Helena Shaw, who isn't a character and is only allegedly female. At one point, she actually quips that he's the one wanted for murder with a nice big picture in the New York Herald, and this is purely a counterfactual but I'm pretty sure the Indy of old would have lent into this. He's in a room full of crooks and mobsters. Being a wanted murderer would, if anything, raise him in their estimations. Murder is the language people like this understand, and the old Indy understood people like this. I think he'd have played up this threat and the danger potential. I think he'd have earned the respect of the room. I think he'd have turned the tables on Helena. But this is new Indy, or, or old Indy? New old Indy. New incredibly old Indy. In other words, it's not Indy, that's what I'm trying to say. And there's only room for one clever clogs in this script, so no. He does nothing of the sort. He just impotently denies the allegations, and then they're interrupted by Jürgen and his Nazis, who despite booking a plane before either Indy or Helena, have arrived long after them, because that is, I guess, what drama demands? I still don't really know how Jürgen knew to come here, by the way. I don't think that makes much sense. I'm not sure it makes any sense, but then very little about this film does, so that's nothing new. Indy vaguely recognises him and asks him if he's still a Nazi, which at least gets an appropriate response from Helena. Jürgen tells him he must be confused. He's incredibly old, after all. His name is Schmidt, as though, what, there were no Nazis called Schmidt? We then get the capitalism line from the trailer. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. And once again, I am forced to ask, who is this for? Does any sentient person still find this sort of thing funny? But capitalism, am I right? The only people who clap lines like that are seals. Well, seals and Twitch streamers, but really, what's the difference? My audience is too sensible to need me to explain why overriding property rights and stealing things for personal gain much more closely resembles communism than capitalism, but the finer points of economic theory aside, the biggest crime is that the line is just so overused it's basically a meme, and not a good 
good meme. It's a shit, lame, normie meme. The left can't meme. I will say I actually did like bits of season one of Fleabag. I didn't adore it, but I thought it was passable comedy. And it was cleverer than this. My theory for Phoebe Waller-Bridge's weird ubiquity in Hollywood at the moment is that she built her reputation by demonstrating a rare ability. She's a female comedian who can make men laugh. Comedians are not, on the whole, a profitable bunch. And you get the sense people like Hannah Gadsby are kept around out of a sense of obligation. I have dragged you through a bit of my shit over the years. Did something funny happen? Yeah. You'd never know it. <laughs> It is, after all, important we let the ladies feel like they're involved. It does a disservice to the very many real women you and I both know who are genuinely funny, probably because they are not professional comedians, and so they understand the difference between a joke and a vague political complaint designed to get applause. Phoebe Waller-Bridge in her earlier career, in her Fleabag season 1 days, was much closer to a normal funny woman than to a female comedian, and resultingly, she proved that you can employ female funny persons and actually make some money, as well as social credit. Being a rare commodity in a market with high demand, she was snapped up and has become Hollywood's designated rental ass. But the problem is that one season of occasionally funny TV does not necessarily make the creator a funny creator. Fleabag is a very particular show, drawing on a very particular and, one suspects, very familiar set of experiences. It's observational humor, where the subject of the observation is genre-specific. You can't simply sit that sort of comedian down, give them a completely different context and set of references, and say, be funny. That requires a much rarer type of person the imaginatively funny person, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge isn't that type of person. Hollywood mistook her early success as having general applicability and replicability. Combine that with the social credit you gain from having a prominent woman on your writing team, and you turn a mistake into a career. She can't be funny in Star Wars, or in Indiana Jones, or probably in Tomb Raider. My fucking god, that's going to be horrific. Because none of these things bears the slightest resemblance to the material she worked with on Fleabag. She is, at best, genre-specific, and yet here she is, lurching from sci-fi to adventure epic and all always, always, always trying to bring everything back to what she knows. Sub-witty one-liners that proceed without reference to setting, to context, to tone, or to story. Anyway, I think I've spent more time on Phoebe Waller-Bridge than any sober man ever would, or certainly should, so on we go. Indy swipes the dial, and we get what I'm sure is a deliberate inversion of the famous swordsman scene from Raiders. You know the one. The guy emerges from the crowd, he waves the sword around threateningly, and Indy impatiently pulls out a gun, shoots him, and walks off. I think I'm right in saying that half the cast had the shits on on that day, and that scene came about in part because nobody had the stomach, see what I did there, for a prolonged fight scene. But it came out wonderfully. That's an example of great situational comedy subverting an established action trope, and it played incredibly well off of Indy's established character. This scene, in Dial of Decentry, only understands that that scene is popular, so hey, wouldn't it be funny if we reversed it? Indy pointlessly waves his whip around, then everyone pulls guns on him, they pause long enough for him to drop to the floor, and he's old enough to make dropping to the floor seem laborious. And then they unload on the window behind him, and they keep unloading on the window behind him, the last time we will see the whip in action. And if current box office is any guide, it could be the last time we will ever see the whip in action. And what a sorry end it is. The swordsman scene is, as mentioned, an accidentally perfect expression of Indy's character. This is the opposite. Indy isn't the swordsman, he doesn't go in for flashy adornments and pointless action. He's efficient, he gets the job done. Why, why, and why again, would Indiana Jones stand in full view of a host of heavily armed thugs and ran wave his whip at them. The answer, of course, is that he wouldn't, but this is Jake Jones, not Indiana Jones, and Jake Jones would do that, so he does do that, and it looks very silly. It'll get a laugh out of brainlets who giggle when they fart in a bath, but compare it to the scene it was inverting, and yeah, there's no point even inviting a competition there, really, that would just be sadism. That one works, this one is dumb. They play a quick game of hot potato with the dial, Indy has it, someone else has it, Teddy has it, then Jürgen gets it, and he slips away into an elevator with the parting line, see you in the past, Dr. Jones. Ooh, very clever. Well done. By the way, I'm pretty sure it was nighttime when they entered the bar, but it's now bright daylight as they emerge. I guess the dial is already fucking with time, even though there's only half of it so far. Jürgen hops in a car and drives off. Indy and Helena get accosted by the police, and Helena tells them to shoot Indy. What a likable character. But then, little Rahim, son of Big Rahim, turns up with his goons, and the police run away. He threatens to behead Helena. She says, does it have to be that bit? And, and yes, with lines like that, I can kind of see his point 
point of view. We further learn that not only did he once bail her out of prison, he was engaged to her, and she sold the ring. Though she's disappointed it didn't fetch as high a price as she thought it would. What a lovely, lovely girl. She calls Indy an aging grave robber, again just lovely, lovely girl, and then Tall Square turns up with a tuk-tuk and another long stupid chase ensues. There's not too much to note here, well, maybe maybe three things, no four, mm, four things, five? We'll go with five and see how we get on. In the first place, even though they hopped in their much more powerful car ages ago, the tuk-tuk turns pretty much a single corner and immediately we've caught up with the Nazis. In the second place, the film seems to think proper, quite expensive cars go at the same speed as a tuk-tuk, which is of course a load of horseshit because tuk-tuks are kind of a joke. In the third place, this is the scene that really made me notice how awful the sound mixing in this film is. Compare it with any equivalent chase in any previous film and note the choices made. You can, for one thing, hear the soundtrack in older films, because the noises of engines and gunshots and crashes are deliberately muted. This gives the chase more character, because part of the function of musical accompaniment is to dictate the mood of the action sequence. It can't in this film because you can barely hear it, ever, which might be a good thing, since John Williams is one of the few entities in the solar system older than Harrison Ford, and you can tell that his heart, his mind, or maybe both, aren't really invested in all this. The score is, for the most part, a jumbled mishmash of older themes and ideas just slapped together. The rest is entirely unmemorable, which is seldom a criticism you can level at John Williams, of all people. He's been out of his indie era for a very long time anyway, leaning more toward the darker, somber tones and melodies of a Shostakovich than the richer and more lively influences that powered the score for the Star Wars prequels, or even Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, and it's not easy to switch between compositional styles. That would be like me listening to nothing but Radiohead suddenly trying to write death metal. But the lack of compelling themes, and the general inaudibility of those that are present, combine them with the length of the chase sequence, all combined to make it feel flat and eventually just kind of boring, which is the last thing you want from a chase sequence. Gee, that was a long one, where were we? Oh yeah, fourth place. In the fourth place, we get more cringe-making Phoebe Waller-Bridge not humour during the course of the chase, as she calls herself witty and brilliant and resourceful and beautiful. How did you end up like this? I think Tywin Lannister was actually borrowing from Margaret Thatcher when he said that any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king. Old Iron Blouse once said that being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. And my god, if she knew how applicable that line is to our present day, she'd probably have died all over again. Anyway, it applies here too. Fifth? I think we're on the fifth place now? Yeah, fifth place. And for all the words spent complaining about how the film reduces the character of Indiana Jones, it's worth highlighting the sterling work it does, reducing its main antagonist as well, who's so far been shown as weak, cowardly, and inept. He's all of these things during this chase, as at one stage, Helena Shaw pulls off a frankly ridiculous maneuver and ends up on the back of the fleeing Nazi vehicle. Jürgen has already been shown to be nervous and fearful of his pursuers, and now she's pretty much choking him out as she lies on the boot of the car with his tie in her hands and him being comedically pulled between her by the neck and the big grunt guy who has grabbed his leg. Generally speaking, if you want your villain to seem in any way intimidating, you do not make him the rope in a game of tug of war. It just makes him look pathetic and weak and helpless, which he is for the most part. I understand not wanting to make him a generic macho action villain. He is a physicist after all, not a fighter. But again, earlier indie films have shown how you can add threat and menace to more bookish antagonists. While this film seldom has Jürgen on screen without finding some new way to reduce the fear factor, he really he needs if he's to be anything approaching memorable. Anyway, that's not an exhaustive list of complaints about the chase sequence. I could also mention that the green screen and CGI is, as almost always with this film, piss poor, but I think it's enough to be going along with. The chase ends, our pathetic non-heroes tuk-tuk breaks down, Jürgen and his Nazi pals board a plane at the airport and hook up with the CIA again. The CIA are not very happy with him. This is where CIA lady explains that hitherto, the US government had really just been indulging Jürgen in his quest for the dial in a bid to keep him happy. But that really now he's taken them to the moon and stood up the president and also murdered a few innocent civilians and blown up parades and such no now he's gone too far so they're pulling the support now only now are they pulling the support i mean what kind of weird ass hattery is this he would have been brought to the u.s as a prisoner of war effectively he'd have been allowed to work because his work is useful but liberty is its own prize he wants the dial so badly the government has the power to stop him even leaving his house and they neither know nor care about the
about the Dial of Destiny, so why? How then, if at all, would he have sold his personal quest to them? What possible reason would they have to indulge him all this way? And why would a government that currently has the magical Ark of the fucking Covenant in its possession, and that until recently had psychomagic crystal skulls in its possession, and lord knows what else, not be interested in a dial reputedly capable of travelling through time? The government in all previous indie films was shown to be aware of and interested in the relics their enemies were chasing. Even if they don't yet know the rumour about the dial's time travelling abilities, though it would be bizarre if they didn't, why would they allow one of their most prized human assets to go traipsing around the world with his own private security force rather than tasking somebody to get the dial for him? If he'd exhausted his usefulness in the moment his rockets landed on the moon, well, why have they been humouring him all the way through the film until this precise moment? How do they not have firmer control over his movements, his travels, his fucking passport? Why have they allowed him to hire more Nazis as a private militia? Why? 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 Delilah? Absolutely none of this makes sense from any perspective, but no, now, now he's crossed the line. Now they've decided they're bringing him in and pulling their support. Bit inconvenient that they'd let him hire private armed Nazi thugs though, isn't it? Bit weird they wouldn't immediately have taken steps to disarm and neutralize them. Bit odd that they've not arrested this rogue Nazi element who's been traipsing all over the world during the fucking Cold War, who could have been immensely useful if he'd been captured by, say, the Soviet Union, but anyway, with crushing predictability, the armed Nazi thugs take out the CIA agents and the CIA lady gets shot. Oh no, what a tragic loss to art. Jürgen, who once again tanks a few hits and has to get rescued because we can't have him seem too menacing, tells CIA woman his real name before she dies. He's not called Schmidt. My name is Faller. Jürgen Faller. As though, as though what, they don't already know this? As though his real name wouldn't have been known to the US government when they brought him over to work for NASA? As though this would even mean anything to the dying CIA woman anyway? Why? What's the point of this revelation? And look, on top of all that, the guy is a fucking Nazi. A racist, he's a race supremacist who's already been shown rather disliking black people, and here, he has finally got the better of a black representative of what is, in his mind, an impure and degenerate America, and the most cut the most biting thing he can think of to say is, my name is Vola, Jürgen Vola. Some Nazi you are, mate. She was more racist than you. Meanwhile, Indy, Helena, and Tall Square are stuck in Tangiers with a broken down tuk-tuk and not much else to speak of. Tall Square delivers a line here that's almost worthy of a titter, as he asks if Indy knew the Wright brothers because they were from Indiana, so maybe he went to school with them. Because he's old, remember? He's, he's really, really old, that's the joke. It's not entirely unfunny, but for Phoebe Waller Bridges in this film, and there's a chance she actually wrote that line herself, so she pops up and tells us explicitly that it was a funny line. The film is congratulating itself for doing a funny Jesus. You know, if you have to tell an audience that a line is funny, it's A, probably not that funny, and B, made much less funny by your self-congratulation. If the line were funny, it could stand on its own. If you want to show that characters in the film find it amusing, have them laugh at it. Have Helena show that she's amused. Laughter is infectious. Telling people they should be laughing, that's that's not infectious. That's not funny except on a meta, desperate sense. Indy, to give him his due, doesn't find their situation funny because he remembers that the Nazis have the dial and they have Basil's notebooks, which will lead them to the Graphikos. Never fear though, because Helena has the answers to any question he could feasibly pose, she says she's got a copy of the notebooks in her head. Not all of them, she takes care to point out, because some of them are just boring, but the important bits, like the location of the Graphikos, which, quite apart from being highly convenient, is also borderline nonsensical. If she knows the location of the Graphikos, which tells the location of the other half of the dial, why has she waited until now to go and get it? All she needs to do, as we'll shortly see, is to hire a boat for herself and do precisely three minutes of scuba diving. And that's it. She should already have that half of the dial. It was entirely within her powers to retrieve it, unlike this half of the dial, which always required that she manipulate other people into giving it to her. And can we pause here because, once again, the film is forcing me to praise Crystal skull. Recall Mutt's introduction there. Recall his characterization. Recall his role in that film. He's young, he's fit, he's agile, he's physical. He can handle himself in a fight. What he isn't is educated, knowledgeable, worldly wise, or familiar with the world he's just been thrust into. Indy, by contrast, is getting on a bit, but he can still handle himself for the most part. More importantly, he is educated and knowledgeable and familiar with the world that he's inhabited for a while now. The result is a dynamic that allows both characters an important role in the script. Indy takes on the position 
position of mentor, educating Mutt, solving the riddles, doing the intellectual heavy lifting, and relying on his nows to get them past problems and obstacles. Mutt is able to shoulder the burden of fighting and running and protecting Indy against the stronger, faster and younger opponents, though Indy can still handle himself in a fight if needs be. For all that film's myriad incompetencies, the relationship between Indy and Mutt is mutually beneficial and rewarding. Each of them gets his due, they complement each other, neither is ridiculed or made redundant by the other. Good stuff! In Crystal Fucking Skull, oh my god. Helena, by contrast, is innately ridiculing, and not just because so many of her lines are meant to ridicule and to demean. Her portrayal as hyper-competent, both physically and intellectually, leaves no space for anyone else, including the nominal protagonist of the film, the guy whose name is above the fucking door. She already knows everything Indy knows. She outwits him, she can beat his enemies in a fight, she could probably beat him in a fight. There's no balance, there's no complementarity. She dominates the script. This is, for all intents and purposes, her film. It's Helena Shaw and the Dial of Destiny, not Indiana Jones. And this scene is a pretty good example of that, because it has Indy actually arguing for his own relevance. He needs permission to be present in his own goddamn film. He tries to argue that she couldn't read the Graphicos even if she found it because it's written in code, so she needs him to translate it. She says, nah. She knows the code. She learned it when she was nine. Defeated on that point, he uses Tall Square's chewing gum to fix a hole in the Tuk Tuk's engine and then looks around desperately for recognition. See, you do need me. Also, I know a guy with a boat and you need a boat to get the dial, so see, I really am useful. As though she couldn't, you know, just have hired a boat, walked to the airport. The film wants this to seem like he's proven his point. But the problem is that, first, he hasn't, because she really could have just hired a boat and she'll go on to not need him once they're aboard it. And second, this is Indiana Jones. This is meant to be his film. He shouldn't need to prove he deserves to be here. It doesn't even serve as a knockdown for Helena, which might have gone some small way to redeem the entire setup, but she's not suffered a setback here. It doesn't serve as a check on her overconfidence. She's not proven wrong. She's not put in her place. She just huffs and lets the old guy come along for the fun of it. If anything, she's just being kinder and more charitable than usual, which isn't hard since she's already tried to have him killed or captured two or three times. That dry and disappointing orgasm dispensed with we get an obligatory map sequence, because this is still nominally an Indiana Jones film, and we arrive in Greece to meet a sailor called Rennie, who is introduced here for the first time because the script needs Indy to have an old sailor diver friend. Rennie is played by Antonio Banderas. This is the ringing endorsement he gave his character and the film as quoted with pride on the Indiana Jones fandom wiki. <laughs> My character is very little. It's almost a cameo. He's just a friend of Indiana's character, and he's looking for him because he needs something from his friend, but he just takes up very little time of the movie, but very happy to be part of a saga that is the history of motion pictures, obviously. Well, obviously. He's right, though. That's an apt description. A cameo by a vaguely recognisable guy, who apparently doesn't even remember the name of Indiana Jones or really give a shit about the film he's in, and who's magicked into the script because Indy needs something from him. And that's it. One for the ages, folks. I'm sure in decades to come, we'll all look back as we do with Brody and Salah and say, yeah, that guy, Ren Rennie, what a guy. Rennie's boat is shit, and he only has one leg, as we know because Tall Square bitches about it. This is really the extent of Tall Square's characterization. He just complains occasionally. Indy's friend is shit, and his boat is shit, and his peg leg is shit. Later, he'll complain that they seem to be helping Indy too much rather than doing it all for the money, and then he will murder someone. He's a great kid. I love Tall Square but short round to shame. On the boat, Helena explains that Basil tracked down the original divers who found the first half of the dial, and they told him that the ship broke up under the sea, meaning the Gravikos is a few feet away from where that was found, and about 20 feet deeper. That's kind of it. And Basil never thought to go and retrieve it, or hire anybody else to do it. The original divers never thought to retrieve it. Helena herself has never bothered trying to retrieve it. Nobody else has ever thought to try and retrieve it, even though it's right there, next to the place they found the dial half, way back in 1901. Rightio then. It's impressive how this film can't even get the fucking MacGuffins right, when that's what the film is about. Well, that and Phoebe Waller-Bridge, obviously. Helena also explains that the ship that sunk went down with a hundred centurions aboard, which would be silly. Centurions were the commanders of groups of a hundred legionaries. Having a hundred centurions aboard is like playing Rome Total War and putting nothing but generals on your ship. And, and which ship come to that? Rowers on Greek and Roman vessels often outnumbered the marines they carried. It wasn't uncommon for a Greek trireme to have about 170 rowers to 30 or so marines. I'm not an expert on Roman naval warfare, but I don't think you would be likely to find a hundred generals on a ship. 
That is, yeah, that's pretty fucking silly. Anyway, the presence of all these generals means, Helena explains, that they weren't just taking half the dial. They were taking the Graphicos as well. But if so, does that mean the Romans knew what it was and where it was leading? In which case, why weren't they following it to try and find the tomb themselves? And how did they even know what it was anyway? Archimedes dies during the siege of Syracuse, from which they presumably pinched the dial and the Graphicos. Something about all this just isn't adding up. Well, whatever. The ship full of generals wasn't just carrying half the dial, they were carrying the Graphicos, the Graphicos that points the way to the other half of the dial and to Archimedes' tomb. That would be Archimedes who died during the siege of Syracuse, who was killed by the Romans who had his body. What? He was killed by a Roman soldier on the spot and against orders to capture him alive. At what point did Archimedes make the dial, split the dial, build his tomb, put half the dial in the tomb, keep all of that secret, write the Graphicos, conceal the Graphicos while under siege and then get killed? No, I don't believe you film. Later on, Helena is playing card tricks on the sailors. This scene contains some of the film's strongest character work, largely because of the paucity of character work elsewhere, but some of it is okay in its own right. She plays a card trick on Indy, she explains how she gives the illusion of choice to the mark, but really she's forcing their decision, and Indy replies, with equal parts derision and judgement, the mark. Which kind of wrong foots Helena. It doesn't really lead anywhere. It's intended to shine a mirror on her, I think, to make her realise that other people aren't just marks or dupes to be tricked, and that if you call them that, they might be offended. The treating them that way is wrong, and to have her express some vague awareness of the fact. The journey the film wants Helena to go on is from ruthless, cold-hearted, amoral bitch to, well, something like a rounded human being, which isn't bad as a concept, it's just the delivery that's kind of lacking. We already know she has higher values than money, she's already been shown having higher values than money. The film simply has her present as this shallow mercenary during scenes where that would be helpful, and then forgets, for example, that her feelings for Tool Square and her feelings about her father all give the lie to this front she's putting on, meaning Indy isn't really telling her or anybody else anything about her that we don't already know. She's not learning anything from him, though I think the film wants that to be the case, but well, it's trying to do character development, so a couple of marks for that. Indy then asks her whether she remembers seeing any dates in her father's notebook, because I think maybe twice before now, for a couple of seconds each time, most recently on the plane to Tangiers, we've seen these dates on a piece of paper, 08 2069 and 08 2039. These dates will go on to be, hmm, well, kind of very important, but also very importantly not. In both cases, much more important than the film has so far portrayed them as being or even trailed them as being. So far they've just been portrayed as put this aside for later snippets of information with no work done to explain either what they do, what they're about, how they were arrived at, and no real curiosity by any of the characters about what they could mean until this very scene. Though of course, if you're paying attention, you'll have spotted that the villain is a Nazi who wants to travel through time, and one of those dates is 1939, specifically two weeks before Hitler invades Poland. So these inexplicable dates, inexplicably calculated by Basil Shaw using a dial he doesn't actually possess, will, obviously, have something to do with Jürgen's nefarious plans later. That, um, yeah, I've made that somehow sound more complicated and intelligent than it is, because what the film has really done is to say, we want our villain to go back in time, so we've written the date he wants to go to down on a piece of paper. Um, that's, that's kind of it, really. It's much more of a contrivance than it is a mechanic, but never fear, that contrivance will be trumped in the end by a contrivance of vastly bigger and more tragic proportions. Anyway, all this prompts Helena to scoff that now Indy believes the dial has magical powers, to which he responds, I don't believe in magic, Wombat, but a few times in my life I've seen things I can't explain. I've come to believe it's not so much what you believe as how hard you believe it. This is um delivered as though, as though it's some sort of profound insight, but really, nah, it's kind of pseudo-profound word salad. In the first place, Indy has no reason not to believe in magic. He's seen the arc of the Covenant melt people's faces, he's seen voodoo work, he's seen the grail fast forward Nazis to death. You can quibble about whether magic is the right word for it, whether power would be a more artful way of putting it. Marcus Brody opts for powers in The Last Crusade when warning the Nazis that they are meddling with powers you cannot possibly comprehend. But that's a terminological disagreement. The substantive, logical argument is the plain meaning of words. It's not what you believe, it's how hard you believe it. But um, well, try reading that back into any of the earlier films. The only belief operative in Crystal Skull is the belief that the crystal skull exists and is important, which leads to it being found. Everything else there is purely mechanistic and pop science fiction. In The Last Crusade, does the false grail melt Donovan's face because he believes it too hard? No, I don't think that's what's happening. Does voodoo work on people who don't believe in voodoo because they believe too hard in the thing they don't believe? Well, no, pretty sure it doesn't apply to Temple of Doom either.
either. Does it only work because the evil heart stealer does believe it hard? Again, no, not convinced. And then the Ark of the Covenant. The Nazis explicitly ridicule the Jewish ritual Belloc performs, so they don't believe in that bit of it all that hard at all. They believe it has some spiritual or occult magical power, hence their search for it. Is the fact they believe it has a vague power, but they believe it very hard, is that what makes their faces melt when they open it? But then, well, if that's the case, why do Indian Marion need to avert their eyes? They don't believe in it, certainly not as hard as the Nazis do, so no. No, I, I don't think the line makes any sense. It doesn't even make much sense in this context, since the dial isn't about magic to begin with. It's essentially a scientific instrument. It actually does measure astrological phenomena and predicts the location of fishes in time. It would do that whether or not you believed in it, and irrespective of how hard you believed it. The only reliable way belief plays any role in any of the Indiana Jones films is that it motivates people to go find the various MacGuffins, but even then, that's using belief very broadly. Since one or two of the villains are motivated to find the MacGuffins for their own worth in finance and fame, not for their religious significance. But no, I don't think that's the way Indy's using the term here. Helena, by the way, is one of the latter sort. She says that she's seen things too, but the only thing worth believing in ever is cash, because the film is still pretending she has some sort of moral journey to go on, even though we know that she doesn't, because she's already been shown not believing that this is the case. It's a shame, because had it been more competently and consistently done, it could have been fairly good. It would give her something to learn from Indy. It wouldn't have been as clear or as useful a mentorship role as he had with Mud, but Indy could have been the moral guide to this woman who, as he should well remember, shares some of the faults of his past adversaries. But the film can't do that because it wants us to like Helena. It's already shown us she doesn't believe what she's saying, and it's made Indy depressed, meaning he has no interest in teaching her anything. The lesson she will half learn by the end of the film is all of her own doing. It has nothing to do with him. It does, however, lead directly into the film's most emotional and best performed scene. As she asks what Indy would do if he could go back in time. Would he bang Cleopatra, for instance? And in response, he says that he'd go back and stop Mutt from enlisting, because he'll die in the war, and that will destroy Marion, and it'll ruin the marriage, leaving Indy nothing to live for. And on its own, this is powerful stuff. It's the first time we see Indy actually convey something like sincere emotion, rather than a mixture of boredom and depression. It allows Harrison Ford to actually do a bit of acting, rather than just playing himself, which is what he's been doing for years now. And the emotional weight is obvious. His story is lately a tragic one. Mutt's death leads directly to Indy's inner death. That's good stuff, or, well, rather, it would be good, except of course that, no, it doesn't really work. It doesn't accord with character, either Mutt's or Indy's. Quite apart from the issue identified earlier, Indy having grown up with loss and having spent most of his time independent and alone anyway, the film wants here to suggest that Mutt, rebellious, headstrong, anti-authoritarian young Mutt, would sign up to fight in Nam for no other reason than to spite Indy. And this is Indy, the guy who's voluntarily signed up and served his country, the guy who's been a secret agent for his country, the guy who spied on communists for his country, and he didn't want Mutt to go and fight the commies? No, I don't really buy this. From what we've seen of both Mutt and Indy, I think Mutt would refuse to go and fight in Nam, and Indy might even think that dishonourable. That would map the generational divide that really did exist in attitudes to that war. Indy has fought communists. Indy likes Ike. I like Ike. See? He just said it right there. Indy's a patriot. Do you have any idea how many medals this son of a bitch won? That guy, that guy just, see, he told us that. Mutt instinctively rebels against authority. He's dropped out of several prep schools because he hated control and regimented learning. It's not my fault, it's hers, you know? She just got PO'd because I quit school. She thinks I'm some kind of goof or something. Just a bunch of useless skills, wrong books. Because <clears throat> I love reading. Me and Ox used to read all the time, but now I can pick them myself, you get me? Yeah, like, like he just told us. Yet for this scene to work, Mutt has to sign up to the US Army to rebel against his father, even though he previously wouldn't accept his father sending him back to school. You're not my dad, okay? You bet I am, and I got news for you. You're gonna go back and finish school. Really? What happened if there's not a damn thing wrong with it, kid, and don't let anybody else tell you any different? You don't remember saying that? That was before I was your father! You're not my father! Yeah, like he just said again. I can understand not watching Crystal Skull, and yes, it probably would be better if that film didn't exist, but it does exist, and this film is a sequel, and this scene relies on that film's existence. So it can't really pretend like the characters put before us by that film are the same as the characters this film is referencing. It's not very easy either to see a way out of this particular bind. You could have it that Indy encouraged Mutt to sign up, which is the source of his guilt, but that wouldn't work very well because Mutt wouldn't have accepted Indy's commands. The closest I think I can come to a 
fix that keeps these historic events intact is if Mutt was drafted and somehow didn't abscond or escape or go AWOL, and Indy would here profess the vague want to go back and get Mutt away from all of it, away from the country, away from the war, so he wouldn't be taken from him. I think that might have worked, just about, but, and going to one of the core issues with this film, it would still make much less sense than almost any other version of the film you can come up with. Mutt shouldn't be dead. Mutt should be alive. Mutt should have dodged the draft, which alienates him from his father. The resulting family strife should have sent Indy off to his studies, or on a personal grail hunt. Events should demand that the government needs to find him, and to approach Mutt to help track him down, forcing Mutt to both work for a government he despises, and which despises him, while also overcoming his disdain for his father. In essence, this should have been a deliberate play on The Last Crusade, with Mutt as the protagonist. Phoebe Waller-Bridge shouldn't be anywhere near the fucking script, never mind in the film. Indy's quest could even have taken him to the Far East, in search of some powerful religious artifact. Mutt could have met up with Short Round. They could have worked together to track Indy down, making Short Round a character with a real role in the plot, rather than a forced cameo of Salah in this film. And this is really just me spitballing. There are just so many stories you could have told, and that's accepting you should have made another film to begin with, which is at best highly doubtful. So yes, the scene is emotional, yep, it's well performed, yep, it's got a lot of pathos, and yep, it ties in with the version of Indy who's been morosely limping around on the screen during this film, but it doesn't accord with past character. It isn't really believable. Strongest scene in the film, and it shouldn't even exist. <sighs> There's one other thing to note about it too. I think someone bought this up either on EFAP or it might have been our show, I can't remember. But while the scene is mostly unaccompanied, which is the right decision, when the soundtrack does kick in, it's another reused theme. It's Marion's theme, or the romance theme from Raiders, which is, well, lazy. It's it's too convenient. The catalyst Indy is describing is his son's death, yet the music would have you believe that the emotional crux lies in the breakup of his marriage to Marion, which, given that's a symptom of a much more tragic cause, is just an odd decision. The music is here downrating Mutt's death and uprating Marion leaving. It's a problem that really stems from the fairly lazy soundtrack for Crystal's Skull, which was also a medley of various established themes. Mutt doesn't have an established motif, and his relationship with Indy doesn't have an established motif, meaning the score here can't easily evoke the tragedy of his loss. Marion's theme would always have been second best. Absent a motif for Mutt, the best approach would, I think, have been to leave the entirety of this scene silent. As it is, it feels like Marion's theme is just included out of a vague sense of obligation. Williams relies on motif to convey tone, mood, event, and how the world feels about his characters, so a new score here probably wouldn't have sufficed because it wouldn't be referencing anything. It's too late to tie it to Mutt's character, so it wouldn't be evoking a feeling about that character, but rather a vaguer mood about the revelation of his death. The answer, if we had our own Dial of Destiny, would be to go back and force Williams to score a strong Mutt theme in Crystal Skull, and then to make the entirety of Crystal Skull a much better film in order that we care to remember it, but absent time travel, nah. I think we should just leave this silent. It's, um, altogether not your best work, John. The next day dawns, and we find Helena rummaging through drawers, where she finds some dynamite, which will be important later, and ogling attractive sailors, because, well, just because, really. She and Indy are going down to the wreck, but not Tall Square, because he can't swim. Though a sailor tells him that it's easy, you just pull and kick, and that will pay off later, when he decides that he can swim after all, because it really is just that easy. One classic indie bit we haven't done yet is snakes. No snakes so far, no snakes forever, in fact. But happily, there are eels. Tall Square suggests they kind of look look like snakes. Indy says, no they don't. So we found a way to fit snakes in, albeit by one remove, or several removes. Actually, no, they're not really related at all, are they? Except that eels are kind of long, they wriggle a bit, that'll have to do. Apparently, if they're near you, you have to stay still, one of the sailors explains, because if they bite you, they'll lock their jaw and you will presumably die. None of that goes on to happen, so file that under useless information. Down we go, and there's never been an underwater segment in any previous indie film, so I don't have footage for it, so um, I don't know, here's Echo the Dolphin instead. Just have fun with that. They have three minutes down under the water, which is more than enough because it just is. Though it does pose the question again, why, if it's this easy to find the Gravikos, has nobody already done it? There are skeletons, and yes, there are eels. There's also a treasure chest, which they find. But this annoys the eels, and the eels kind of attack, albeit without doing any damage. It undertakes the chest, and it looks for a while like this is her third or fourth attempt to kill Indy. As he's surrounded by and attacked by the eels, though without them doing the whole lockjaw thing, we were 
explicitly warned about a couple of minutes ago. There's a kind of Raiders reference here, as he lights the flare to hold them off, but it doesn't really work. And we might feel the peril a bit more if we could actually see what was happening, but no matter. Eleanor returns and pulls Indy out, and the eels decide that it's not worth pursuing them. They just kind of disappear. However, inconveniently, the Nazis have arrived on another boat. The Nazis know where to come, because they have Basil's notebooks, and these pointed the way to the Gravikos. Though I think I'm right in saying that Indy had the notebooks for years, and until a few scenes back, he was still insisting that nobody knew where the Gravikos is. He did at one point say, essentially, that he got bored and stopped reading Basil's notebooks because he thought the guy was mad. Classic Indy never follows clues, so maybe he missed it. Or maybe they were a different set of notebooks? Eh, uh, who really cares? The Nazis cut the oxygen pipe to one of the sailors and he immediately drowns. Nobody attempts to save him. Such a shame they're not wearing inflatable life belts that could have immediately returned him to the surface. Oh, never mind. So they just kind of let him die. Indy Helena and Antonio Banderas return to the surface to find the Nazis have taken over their boat and killed the rest of the sailors, but they've kept Tall Square hostage. Indy and Helena don't think it might be worth dropping the Graficus. At the very least, to delay and frustrate the Nazis, no, they, they just keep hold of it, so naturally it's immediately taken from them. Indy asks Jürgen who he's working for. Jürgen says he's on his own now. Things move forward, Dr. Jones, and sometimes they move backward. <laughs> is anyone uh, not already aware that there's time travel in this movie? What is this coy shit, Jürgen? We all know what your plan is, mate. You're not being clever. We learn that the Graficos is indeed coded using the Polybius cipher. Though they've been captured by Nazis and most of the sailors are dead, including the guy she was flirting with just a few minutes ago, Helena decides to quip that Indy owes her 50 quid. Funny, funny girl. Jürgen isn't familiar with the Polybius cipher, but he knows that Indy is, so he asks him to decode it. Indy refuses, so Jürgen shoots Antonio Banderas. He's, he's dead now. My character is very little. It's almost a cameo. He's just a friend of Indiana's character, and he's looking for him because he needs something from his friend, but he just takes up very little time of the movie, but happy to be part of a saga that is of the history of motion pictures, obviously. Yeah, you weren't wrong, my friend. Indy still refuses to help, but Helena offers to translate it instead, because she doesn't do noble deaths, she says. She'll do it for £100,000. Jürgen accepts while lighting a cigarette, and I believe this is the first time we see him smoking in the entire film. And it's, um, it's a bit of an odd one. One of the lesser known facts about the Nazis is that they actually agreed with modern public health lobbyists about smoking, and they instituted many campaigns against it. Nazi is as Nazi does. They also campaigned against drinking, and famously, Hitler was a vegetarian. The total vegetarian, anti-smoking, anti-free speech pushed ideology through schools, didn't like Jews, vaguely socialist, um, no. No, I don't know where that joke was going. Just, um, yeah, just forget I started it. Anyway, this is a very convenient cigarette. As I say, I don't think Jürgen's been shown smoking at all throughout the film until this point. He's a Nazi, Nazis didn't like smoking, he also believes that Hitler didn't go far enough, and he's hitherto been portrayed as very prim and proper if you ignore the whole racism thing, but he has to start smoking in this scene because if he didn't, Eleanor would have no way to light the dynamite that she's concealed in her pocket, and that presumably survived being submerged under the water. She prances around, distracting them with history trivia questions, while subtly letting Indy in on her plans because, of course, she's the bright and brilliant thing who rescues him from yet another terrible situation. And she cheekily pinches Jürgen's cigarette, which she's just fine with. I would have socked her if she'd stolen mine, and I'm not even a Nazi, no matter what various Reddit threads would have you believe. This is true, and I stand by it. Indy, by the way, could have just told them anything. He could have lied about the translation, because they can't read Polybius, they'd have no way of knowing. And this is sort of what Helena falls into doing as well. Confusingly, her distraction isn't quite misdirection, but also it is. She actually is translating the code word for word, which could be very helpful to the Nazis later, except that she makes a wild gamble that it won't be, because the thing she's only just laid eyes on and hasn't even touched at the time she offers to decode it actually isn't what it seems. She knows it's too heavy to be made of wooden wax. She knows this even before she held it. Assuming it were exactly what it appeared to be, which is just a Polybius square, her translating it would just be dumb, because, as is but established, none of the Nazis can read Polybius. She could literally tell them anything to lead them astray, just as Indy could have done. But it's a common trope in modern movies. People who are captured lose all agency. The example that always comes to mind is Wong in Multiverse of Madness. Captured by Wonder and taken to the Temple of Doom, no relation, he is the only one able to translate the symbols on the wall and such, and she has no hold over him anymore because she's already wiped out most of his temple buddies and they are miles away. But rather than lying to her, trying to misdirect or delay her, Wong just merrily goes around giving her accurate translations, ensuring that she can bring her plan to fruition. Because he's an idiot. But that idiocy spreads. A similar thing happens in Avatar The Way of Water, with Spider happily leading Smurf Chip Hazard toward his surrogate family to kill them. There are many other examples, this is yet another one. Using the cigarette to light the fuse on the dynamite, Helena throws it and they run. Bert, no, Bert? What, who the fuck is Bert? Sorry, no, he's such a forgettable character. Boyd kicks it down 
down to the deck below and it explodes, but by this time Indy, Helena and Tall Square have stolen the boat the Nazis rode in on and are off. Now until recently I lived on a boat. I lived on a boat for a good few years. I'm actually trying to sell it at the moment. If anyone wants a narrow boat in London, hit me up. It's yours for about 50k. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that boats cannot survive dynamite being detonated inside them. Even if you assume that it wouldn't rupture the steel hull, which are usually not as thick as people ever like assume them to be. And anyway, it's a dicey proposition, especially on a boat as old as Antonio Banderas is. The concave steel hull would then direct most of the force of the explosion back up to the floor above, and the floor of the boat isn't going to be anything like as thick or as sturdy as the hull. So either it would have blown a hole in the bottom, in which case they sink, or it would have blown the roof off, in which case they are dead. But neither of these things happen. The Nazis just hang around there looking a bit disheveled. Helena, meanwhile, is wildly celebrating their escape, leading Grumpy Indy to gruffly exclaim, My friend was just murdered. She says, Sorry, but that's, um, that's about as much as we're going to get. Indy then complains that she told the Nazis everything, and she says yes, she did, but the tomb isn't actually in Alexandria. The code was a lie. She knows this because the tablet is too heavy to have been made by wax and wood, though she couldn't have known that before she touched it. So there must be something inside it. But yeah, no, I, mean, like, I can't help but reiterate, she cannot have known that at the moment she offered to decipher it for Jürgen. She had no reason to suspect it even. So what was her plan if, as expected, the cipher was all there was to it? Just carry on translating it? And don't get me wrong, it is a neat trick in the end. Indy soaks it in a conveniently available flammable liquid and melts the wax to reveal a gold disc with a different message on it. But hell, that, that is quite the fucking gamble to play against the Nazis. What if it was just a lump of lead to reinforce the Graphicus? What if it was literally anything else besides the precise thing they needed it to be? In accurately translating it, she'd then have given the Nazis all the information they needed and they would be left with nothing. As it is, through sheer dumb luck, it turns out that inside the Polybius Square is a golden disc that points them to the actual location of Archimedes' tomb, the highly secretive lost for two millennia tomb of Archimedes, which is in a tourist attraction in Sicily. Fuck you, film. Anyway, in her brilliance, Helena accurately translated the Polybius cipher, which pointed the Nazis toward the ruins of the Library of Alexandria. She then got incredibly lucky in that she could instantly tell there was something inside the Polybius square, so instantly that she seemingly knew it before she'd even touched it. She got even luckier in that the square contained a disc that pointed them in the true right direction, but despite this fantastic combination of genius wit and luck, the one thing she didn't count on was that Nazis have eyes. They can see things, and so all they have to do is watch where Indy's boat is going. And because Helena did accurately translate the square, and helpfully informed them in doing so that Archimedes only ever lived in two places, she still ended up giving them most of the important information they need. Which is all redundant anyway because all they really need to do is hop on a lifeboat and follow the other one wherever they're going, which lo and behold is precisely what they do. Albeit via some peculiar editing, because we see Jürgen take out his binoculars and look through them. He's spying on the leaving boat. Then we get the whole melt the box read the disc thing. Then we get a travel sequence, the map sequence, in which we see them round the entirety of Greece. And only then do we cut away to Jürgen, who has presumably been watching them for several hundred miles by this point, who now says, they're going west, not east. Honestly, like, well fucking done, my friend. It's just kind of comical. It's slightly less ridiculous, but still quite silly. Indy asks Tall Square how much fuel their stolen boat has. You know, the boat the Nazis used to get to the other boat. Tall Square replies that the tank is full, meaning that the Nazis took this boat all the way from Greece to rendezvous with Antonio Banderas' ship in the east of the Aegean, while Bern Burning no fuel at all, which is kind of them, because it means this tiny little boat can now take Indy, Helena, and Tall Square all the way from the East Aegean to Sicily, which by my calculation is a trip of around 1500 to 2000 kilometers on a single tank of gas. Even more ridiculously, the Nazis are about to follow them on that same immense journey on a lifeboat, a little rubber lifeboat with an outboard motor for up to 2000 kilometers. This is not how petrol works. Anyway, as mentioned, we're heading to a Sicilian tourist attraction in which is a secret tomb that nobody has ever discovered despite it being in a tourist attraction. Teddy gets bullied by some tourist children for wearing a straw hat because, you know, straw hats in Sicily in the 1960s are just so outlandish and silly. Teddy moans to Helena that they're being morally good when they should just be stealing things for money. Then he steals some money from the evil child who mocked his completely unremarkable hat, goes to buy an ice cream where he gets kidnapped by Jürgen, who, despite beginning at an immense disadvantage, has somehow already already arrived in precisely the right place to wait for him to buy his ice cream and walk into their trap, meaning
meaning they were following right behind our heroes. And at no point did anyone turn around and think, hmm, those Nazis, they kind of seem to be following us. This is not how travel works. But they shove Tall Square into a van that they've somehow already had the time to procure and position, and they drive off. Indy and Helena see this all happening, they steal a wedding car, they drive off as well. Indy explains that because Teddy knows about the tourist attraction, the Nazis will use him but not hurt him. The attraction, by the way, is the Ear of Dionysius. It's a real place, fascinating and sordid history. Legend has it, though that legend likely originates with Caravaggio rather than with fact, that Dionysius I of Syracuse put his political prisoners in the cave. The cave has unique acoustics, allegedly voices would echo 16 times if you stood in the right place, and he used those unique acoustics to snoop on his political prisoners' secrets. There are, though, a few problems with using it as the secret location of Archimedes' tomb, however, not the least of which being, it is a fucking tourist attraction. Millions of people have been through this, it's been thoroughly surveyed and explored, and the means by which they find the tomb are so laughably simple that there is no way it wouldn't have been uncovered centuries ago. Slightly less importantly, the cave today isn't the same as it was when it was first dug. Quakes and earth movements have actually made the famous perfect echo impossible to hear because that part of the cave isn't accessible anymore. So it's kind of lucky that no earthquake or ground movement collapsed or revealed Archimedes' tomb or left it caved in and completely inaccessible, but yeah, well, fuck it, it's just a film, geology's boring, facts don't matter. Even though the Nazis left first, Indy says, we've got to get there first, and so they do. The last of the tourists are leaving as they arrive, but there's nobody there to stop people just wandering in. They walk about 25, 30 feet inside, and they spot a crescent sliver of light coming from a gap in the ceiling above them. Just like on the Graphicos, apparently, and well, yeah, that's, that's phase one done. Apparently, Nobody in the 2,000 years since Archimedes' death, during which this cave was used for a huge variety of purposes, latterly a notable tourist attraction, at no point did anybody walk a little way into it and look up and say, hey, there's a gap in the ceiling. No one, no one at all did that. I do not believe you, film. This is why you don't put super secret Lost for Millennium MacGuffins inside tourist attractions. You can, if you really have to, make famous places important parts of the quest, but then you have to do something to explain why nobody before our protagonists was able to follow the clues or stumble across them by accident. The Last Crusade does this with Kazim, of the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword, whose group is dedicated to protecting the Holy Grail and so preventing people from following clues to its location. This film does nothing of the sort. There is no reason the tomb shouldn't already have been discovered. But anyway, Indy and Helena climb the rock face toward the Crescent of Light. Indy moans that his knees ache because, you know, he's very, very old. Don't think I've mentioned that yet. I don't mind this particular instance, though. Helena patronizingly says she understands which gives Indy an excuse to recite his long list of experiences that she hasn't had. Being tortured by voodoo, getting shot nine times, etc. Plenty of references, but here they do actually fit the scene. And the dialogue makes sense in context, and it doesn't, like so many other instances in the film, feel too forced. The Nazis have apparently taken a huge detour, because their van only now pulls up outside the cave, even though they left first. They don't have Indy and Helena's vast knowledge of antiquity. They don't even know exactly where the cave entrance is. They have to ask a tour guide. And Tall Square is never shown leading them or giving them any information. They just walk in, they spot the crescent of light, and they think, hey, must be up there. Yes, film, which anybody could have done at any point in the last 2,000 years for fuck's sake. Meanwhile, Indy and Helena are crossing a rickety rope bridge that exists for some reason. Indy asks how Helena met Tall Square. She explains that he tried to steal her purse in Marrakesh when he was 10 years old, though so she hit him repeatedly with her car door, but he didn't let go, so they became friends. What a lovely, 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 lovely person. I mean, Tall Square is a shit character, don't get me wrong, but you don't hit 10-year-olds repeatedly with car doors and come away from it looking nice. You try it, see what happens. Indy finally cottons on to the Helena problem I mentioned several years ago, her attachment to Teddy and the fact she memorized her dad's notebooks proves that she is not all about the money. And this might have come as a revelation had the film not already shown us that she's not all about the money. It's trying to continue a journey it ended hours ago. This is faux growth, fake development. They squeeze through some rocks and get covered in bugs. We know that Indy doesn't mind bugs because we've seen the earlier films. This film, though, hasn't seen the earlier films, and so both he and Helena go into a panicky tiz. At the end of the corridor of bugs is a room venting methane gas, which is lethal if you're exposed to it for too long, as attested to by the corpses strewn around, presumably of all the hundreds of tourists who stumbled into this incredibly easy-to-find place by accident. Only Helena is shown struggling with the methane, though, coughing and spluttering and such. Indy, by contrast, is absolutely fine, because he's really old, and he's been living in the smell of his own farts for several decades. The antechamber has a big statue of a goddess, and a pool of water with some rocks lying around it. Because this film's very occasional look at history never exceeds, what, 
the third grade? The trick here is the one thing everybody knows about Archimedes. He sat in a bath once and he noted the water displacement and he said, Eureka! So Indy and Helena stand in the water, they push some rocks into the water, the displacement triggers a mechanism that turns the pool into a slide and just like that, we found the tomb of Archimedes. Undiscovered for 2,000 years? Oh, fuck you. Undiscovered for 2,000 years, despite it venting methane all over the place. I don't really know why they even included that. It's not a mechanic that recurs or that impacts them in any way, besides making Phoebe Waller-Bridge gag. And no, I'm, I'm not going there. But when they do figure out the third grade water displacement experiment and tumble into the tomb proper, the methane just stops being a thing. So, well, where was it coming from? Why was it coming from? Who was it coming from? Was it really in Indy all along? Was he just trying to pretend like he hadn't done one? Meanwhile, with the Nazis, Tall Square tries to run away but gets captured and handcuffed to generic muscle grunt and led back into the cave. It's not especially clear why Teddy is still alive, even he wasn't shown leading them to the ear of Dionysius, though it wouldn't be unfair to assume that he did that off the screen. But now that they're in the cave, now that they've found the light crescent, his stock of knowledge is exhausted. And once again, these people are Nazis. Why haven't they shot him? The fact they haven't shot him means, of course, that he continues to cause them problems. Having been handcuffed to generic Muscle Grunt, the Nazis cross the rickety wooden bridge of uncertain provenance, with Tall Square and Muscle Grunt bringing up the rear. Muscle Grunt is very big and very heavy. He almost loses his balance. Tall Square pinches the handcuff keys from him, but then the bridge collapses beneath them and they tumble into the water, a fast-moving subterranean river that flows out through a grate presumably installed many centuries ago by the same people who didn't spot the Tomb of Archimedes just down the corridor. There's a very convenient hole in the gate, which is just big enough for Tall Square to squeeze through, but nowhere near big enough for Muscle Grunt to follow. The fact there's a big hole in it might lead you to believe that it's very old and poorly maintained, and so maybe Muscle Grunt could break it? But that's not what happens, no, because this is Tall Square's moment to shine. And by moment to shine, I mean cross from involuntary manslaughter to premeditated murder. Because, having squeezed through the hole in the grate, he uses the handcuff keys to detach himself from Muscle Grunt. Fair enough, so far, Tall Square has escaped. Muscle Grunt can't follow him. So, what does Tall Square do next? He attaches the other end of the handcuffs to the grate and he locks them in place, then throws away the key, meaning what slim chance Muscle Grunt might have had to escape and survive is now gone. Tall Square has deliberately ensured that he drowns. It's actually a really horrifying death. And you know both these characters know it's a horrifying death because Muscle Grunt gives quite a genuine scream of shock and fear. Tall Square is just kind of a dick. There's no point dressing that up. Yeah, sure, Muscle Grunt is a Nazi but it does take a cold, cruel, calculating heart to voluntarily ensure somebody's death in this particular way. Remember Short Round? Short Round could kick ass, but he was also kind of cute and endearing, or incredibly annoying if he's not your thing, but he was supposed to be cute and endearing and childlike. Tall Square, by contrast, is just an asshole all the way through. Lol, old man is old. God, old man is useless. Why are we helping old man rather than stealing from him and leaving him alone? Old man's old friends are really shit. You mock my hat, I steal from you. There's a 70% chance you'll drown? How does 100% sound? But Platoon, you might reply, isn't Tall Square going to drown as well? Didn't he tell us just a little while ago that he couldn't swim and never has? Well, in the real world, yes, you would be right. Remember, this isn't the real world, though. And Antonio Banderas told him that swimming was easy. All you have to do is pull and kick. So that's what he does. He can swim now. He survives. <sighs> Thank goodness. Back in the tomb, which we know is the tomb because Indy looks at it and says, Archimedes tomb, because the target audience for this film is certifiably dumb, they find the dusty old skeleton holding the other half of the dial. But since we only have 30 minutes left, it's time to fast forward the time travel stuff because we haven't really done enough of that yet. There are two peculiar revelations gleaned from the tomb. The first is that the carving of a phoenix on its side appears to have propellers. The second is that on Archimedes' corpsified wrist, there is a watch, a watch that will not be invented for a thousand years after his death. Hmm, I wonder where this could possibly be going. And look, yeah, god, th there's a lot to be said about all of this. We're gonna save most of it for later, though. The only thing worth noting at this juncture is that when Helena tells Indy to look at the carving, Indy initially dismisses it because, well, phoenixes are a common icon. That's what prompts Helena to demand that he take another look because, as she points out, it has propellers. And these two pieces of information kind of work against each other because phoenixes are indeed common icons, yet 
notably, no common Phoenix icon elsewhere in the world, or indeed in recorded history, has a propeller. You can get around that if Archimedes is about to have a very personal individual encounter with an, um, <laughs> yeah, a phoenix. Uh, but as we will shortly and tragically see, that is not what happens. Thousands of people have this same encounter. Oh, and in fact, no, there's one more thing I'll note at this point, because earlier in Sicily, we caught a glimpse of a puppet play being put on for the tourist children. It depicts the Roman attack on Syracuse with the notable addition of dragons, which it's not terrible as far as foreshadowing goes, though what it foreshadows is terrible. But that likewise poses problems, because it means the tale we are about to witness has passed down in folklore involving dragons. Dragons is the imagery evoked later on, yet here, on the tomb, and on the tomb alone, it is a phoenix. And the phoenix and the dragon come from the same source, so why does this one tomb have a phoenix while the entirety of the myth surrounding it references dragons? And as I've asked before and will ask again, how did Archimedes, who dies in the siege of Syracuse, find the time to have this elaborate tomb made and himself entombed in it with half of the dial that he split up before he is instantly killed by Roman soldiers? I wonder if we'll ever find that out. We won't. But yes, more on that presently. For now, Indian Helena are interrupted in the tomb by the arrival of Jürgen and his remaining Nazis. Jürgen snatches the dial and holds a gun to Helena. He informs Indy that he's already lost his son and his wife, so does he really want to lose his godchild as well? And ordinarily, the answer to that question would be no. But we can't help but recall that this godchild is Phoebe Waller-Bridge, so uh, really? As for how Jürgen knows all this about Indy, we have to run with the assumption that a file he was handed much, much earlier contains all of this very personal information, and that he's just kind of forgotten to use it as leverage or to mention it since then, even though on the boat he had the perfect opportunity to do exactly this, and opted for shooting Antonio Banderas instead, even though he had no reason to suppose that Antonio Banderas was anything more than a hired hand, but whatever the fuck, the writers just hadn't thought of this bit yet. Indy relents and gives Jürgen the dial, and he puts the two pieces together. He takes out a centerpiece, and instantly knowing what to do with it and where it goes, he places it in the center of the dial. History's greatest moment, he says, it's end. And um, I, um, yeah, I almost like the line, except that I then remember that it, no, it's not actually what he believes, is it? He's not ending history. He doesn't believe he's ending history. He's going back to change history. Somehow, in the intervening, Teddy has made it back to shore, and all the way back to the cave, and into the cave, and is now hiding up on an overhanging statue overlooking the scene. He uses this moment to stage an insurrection, which leads to a gunfight. Indy tells he and Helena to run, but while he's distracted, he gets shot. Shot in the sort of upper left chest area, I think, maybe? At a push the shoulder? Either way, it's inconveniently close to the heart. It's not a good place to get shot, but um, I can't help but note that there's still 28 minutes of the film left, which is a long time to remain shot and bleeding heavily without dying. The film gets around this by just kind of forgetting that he's been shot until it becomes relevant again right at the end, but given how clumsily tacked on the rest of the film is after this point, I wouldn't be surprised if in fact the original script didn't have this problem to begin with. It feels rather like this battle in the tomb could have ended with Indy getting shot, but the Nazis being defeated before they have a chance to use the dial. No time travel thing at the end. That would be similar-ish to The Last Crusade. Needless to say, that's not the ending we're going to get, but I do think the original plan was for the film's close to be much shorter and less mind-fuckingly ridiculous than it ended up being. As in fact occurs, the Nazis take Indy hostage and Helena and Tall Square escape. There's yet more clunky editing here. Helena says, we can't just leave him, and Tall Square replies, we're not, follow me, paying off a moral arc he hasn't even begun, never mind progressed along. But then, mere seconds later, we cut to them hiding between some rocks and watching the Nazis dragging Indy out, and it's Helena who says, come on, leading Teddy away. So who's leading who here? What was Tall Square's plan? Because it sounded very much like he had one, only for the film meant to switch things around within seconds and have him follow Helena, who now has a plan instead. Who's more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? The Nazis chuck Indy into the back of their van and drive off. Tall Square and Helena find that the tires on their car have been slashed, though within seconds, Helena has found both a motorbike and the keys to a motorbike in some shed somewhere, so they use that instead. Why Why is it here? Who does it belong to? How did she know where to look for it? How did she know where the keys were? How did all of this happen in less time than it took the Nazis to drive more than a few feet down the road? Mightn't the Nazis notice that the headlight on the motorbike is on and they seem to be being followed? Do Nazis not check their mirrors? Is that a thing? These, though, are minor questions. Much bigger questions a building, as Jürgen fiddles about with the Dial of Destiny, explaining that one thing does this and the other thing does that, and it corresponds with latitude and longitude, so he knows both where the time portal is and where the time portal leads, or rather, so he thinks. He's wrong, but the reason is
is so ludicrous that really I don't think we can blame him for it. You can never truly predict how bad modern writing is, not in its specifics. There's no way he could have foreseen the trick the writers are about to play. Indy, looking the worst for wear at this precise moment, he will recover a bit later and then forget about that as well, asked what Jürgen's plan is. Who is he going to kill? Is he going to kill Churchill? Is he going to kill Ike? No. That would be too easy. Jürgen, you see, is a fanatical purist. He watched as Hitler made mistakes, he watched as the Nazis gained defeat from the jaws of victory with their invasion of Poland, and he has a plan to change it. History is the longest of losses, he says. It's just a question of whose. He's going to kill Hitler. <laughs> oh my giddy fuck. What is this nonsense? Like, where do we even begin with this nonsense? Can we even begin with this nonsense? Well, it is my job, so I suppose, yeah, let's, let's give it a go. So, in the first place, what does Jürgen imagine will happen if he turns up one day and shoots Hitler on the eve of battle? Does he imagine that he, Jürgen, will survive this act? We know people tried to assassinate Hitler. They tried a few times. Klaus von Stauffenburgs is the most famous example. All of them were executed as traitors. Second, what does he imagine? imagine the loss of the Führer will do A to the Nazis and B to their war effort. There was an established chain of command to be sure, meaning the process of replacing Hitler would be formulaic, and it would also lead to Jürgen's execution, but it's a feature of dictatorships built around personality cults that peaceful democratic transitions of power do not typically occur. We know this because we've seen plenty of dictators deposed over the years and very rarely does power seamlessly switch to the anointed or self-chosen successor. Operation Valkyrie, the most famous real-life attempt to stage a coup following Hitler's attempted assassination, relied on the deliberate altering of contingency plans in a bid to defang the various people and armed organizations who would otherwise have automatically stepped in to replace the Fuhrer, most notably Himmler's SS. Valkyrie actually sought to pin the blame on the SS in the event of a successful assassination, partly because the SS would need to be removed in order for the coup to take full control of the country, but also because the SS could credibly be suspected of instigating a coup. Powerful paramilitary and secret service organizations paradoxically enforce order while being the greatest threat to it. The Roman Emperor Constantine actually disbanded the famous Praetorian Guard and attacked their barracks because they had so often been involved in plots against the Emperor that they were guarding. So what exactly was Jürgen's succession plan? He states he wants to go back to 1939 and attend the scheduled meeting with Hitler, who is expecting an update that evening on the V1 rocket, and there he will shoot him. Okay then, but what about Himmler? What about Reichsmarschall Göring? What about Goebbels and Bormann? Let's assume that for the sake of argument all these people heard about the assassination of Hitler and said, yeah, fair enough, let's make Jürgen the Führer. But even if they did that, Hitler did not suddenly say in 1939, fuck it, we're having Poland. The Nazis had been trying to bring Poland into the anti-Comintern pact since 1934. They'd promised them territory if they joined the war against the Soviet Union. But Hitler had already withdrawn from the non-aggression pact with Poland and the Anglo-German Naval Treaty and annexed Czechoslovakia before the date Jürgen wants to go back to, meaning Jürgen would have had next to no room for maneuver. On top of which, I'm pretty sure the molotov ribbon Trump pact, the Nazi-Soviet pact if you will, was signed by Hitler the same month that Jürgen plans to return, and earlier the same month. It was that agreement, formerly economic ties and non-aggression with a secret component, that defined their respective borders and that led to the partition of Poland between them, that freed the Nazis to focus more of their war effort on the Western Front and the Soviets to put off armed confrontation before their military buildup was complete. Whenever you hear that the Soviet Union really won the war against the Nazis, it's always worth remembering that the Nazis only got as far as they did because they allied with the Soviets first. First. The pact was a delaying tactic because these two powers would inevitably have come into conflict eventually. If Jürgen killed Hitler and didn't invade Poland, it would have amounted to ceding territory to the Soviets, which would have posed a threat that would have sped up the development of two fronts to the Nazi war effort, which would have weakened them before the invasion of France and weakened them against the Soviet threat, thus leaving them in an incredibly precarious position. They arguably would have lost the war sooner if Jürgen had got his way and they hadn't invaded Poland. And let's be clear, Jürgen's plan isn't to depose Hitler and avert the war. He's a dyed-in-the-wool Nazi. He says that Hitler lit a fire that could have lasted for a thousand years, but that Hitler's mistakes expunged that chance. But Jürgen presents no alternative. He wouldn't have survived his own plot, and Nazi Germany would have been weakened and probably destroyed had it succeeded. Ah, but he's coming back from the future. Maybe, maybe, he could bring some spectacular new technology back with him. Jet planes, high-tech weapons, nuclear weapons. In fact, that would have been a comparatively sensible plot. Bring back the knowledge the Nazis needed to advance 
advance their nuclear program, which they had since around, oh no, my memory's failed me, 1938, I think it was. Have the Nazis get the nukes before the Allies, and you have a man in the high castle situation. That wouldn't have required killing Hitler. That would simply involve bringing papers and knowledge back and materials if you can get hold of them. But that's not what Jürgen does. Jürgen makes a concerted attempt to bring nothing new back from the future and to leave himself as little time to alter the past as possible. He has a convenient Nazi uniform in the van, just in case we weren't clear that he is one, I guess. And they're traveling now to an airfield where an old World War II bomber is waiting for them. So Jürgen believes he has control of time. He has access to modern science and weaponry. He has access to nuclear secrets. And his plan is to go back to 1939 with nothing, save a uniform and a pistol, and shoot Hitler at the last possible moment before the invasion of Poland starts the domino effect that leads to the rest of the Second World War. Fucking great plan, my dude. What an absolute fucking moron. It's so on its face dumb that there's nothing to invest in here. It so obviously can't work that we can't care about it. It's just goofy and ridiculous. While the plane is prepping for takeoff, Helena and Tall Square arrive and sneak into the airfield. Helena spots another plane and asks if Tall Square can fly it. Tall Square says he's never flown that type of plane. She responds, you've never flown any plane. Okay, so why did you ask, you dumb bitch? And then Tall Square says he'll go and start it anyway, and Helena says, no, Teddy. As though, as though what? What, what was your plan here, woman? What's your line of inquiry? That, like, what did you expect Tall Square to be doing? Well, obviously he has to pay off that awful foreshadowing from earlier in the bar with the drunk pilot, but what did she expect him to do? Jürgen and the Nazis drag Indy aboard the bomber and plunk him down. Tall Square runs for the smaller plane and gets into the cockpit and turns on the engine. Note that it is at most a two-seater. It'll carry more than that later. And Helena, meanwhile, grabs the motorbike and goes chasing the Nazis down the runway, climbing aboard the bomber just as it takes off. So, we have Indy and Helena and Jürgen and the Nazis on one big plane, being chased by Tall Square on a second plane. Oh, and, and we have a random pilot guy who wakes up in the back of Tall Square's plane when they're already airborne. He was just sleeping in the back of it for some reason. Maybe he couldn't pay his rent? And he didn't wake up when the engine started or throughout the entire takeoff or the moment when they were flying into a storm. He just wakes up at the last minute to act as essentially, well, furniture. He accomplishes very little. I don't know who he is. I don't know what his name is. I don't know why he's here. I don't know why they thought to include him in the script. He's just, he just is. Helena sneaks her way through the bomber's hold. Indy, meanwhile, watches some bullets vibrate off the seat beside him. They drop to the floor. There are two suitcases on the floor. The suitcases are vibrating as well. They are moving slowly past each other because of the vibrations, and... <laughs> oh no, God. Ugh. And this is what causes Indiana Jones to start yelling about continental drift. Because, you see, continental drift is a thing. I believe the North American and European landmasses are moving away from each other to the tune of... Is it one inch every year? Which we very seldom talk about or worry about because that is statistically insignificant. At a constant rate of drift, it would take 39,000 years for the continents to move a kilometer away from each other. But, you see, this is incredibly important to the film because the film has just decided in this very moment that it's incredibly important to the film. Archimedes didn't know about continental drift. That means the calculations we were never privy to that tells Jürgen he's going back to 1939 are wrong somehow, because the portal isn't where Archimedes thought it was. So they could be going anywhere, but not to 1939. Oh god, yeah. The word bullshit, it doesn't really suffice. This is this is just a mindfuck. The portal is in the sky. The sky is not affected by continental drift. The portal's location isn't determined by reference to things on the ground that are, it's determined by reference to astrological, not geological movements. The solar system moves 720,000 kilometers every hour. The average distance between the Earth and the Sun increases by 1.5 inches every year. These are likewise statistically insignificant given the sheer size of the galaxy, but these are the only things that could have the effect continental drift is said to have here, i.e. changing points of reference and then fucking up the dial. So we're meant to believe that because the continents have moved mere inches since our Archimedes time, this means the dial is pointing to the wrong portal in the sky? Is that it? How does that work? Or is it pointing to the, is the portal pointing to the, it doesn't make sense. Is there, it's like, is there another portal somewhere that would take them to the right place? An inch away from the other one? But then no, they would have spotted that. Why, when they go through the portal, do they arrive in exactly the same place? If not for the fact that continental drift has been negligible, or in fact, entirely ineffective. And that's without even getting into the time travel fuckery itself. We're going to save that for a few minutes time. Or is it a few minutes past? <laughs> 
So Indy mentions continental drift and starts maniacally cackling because he saw a couple of suitcases moving on the floor. Great stuff. Jürgen initially dismisses this idea, but his doubts grow more pronounced the closer they get to the portal in the sky, until at the last minute he decides fuck it no, the old man raving about briefcases and continental drift is right. It's not just another dementia episode, we really do have to turn around. But by this point, the time portal has engaged its tractor beam because time portals in the sky that randomly appear have those, and somehow this hasn't caused major disruption to establish flight paths before now. So they go tumbling through it anyway, closely followed by Tool Square and Random Pilot Dude. Both planes stall as they go through the portal and begin to plummet toward the Earth. My theory, by the way, for the sudden appearance of Pilot Dude is that someone in the writer's room said, Hey, Tool Square probably couldn't restart a stalled plane mid-fall, could he? He only had a couple of lessons from that drunk pilot guy at the bar. We probably do need someone with him who can help him. Because yes, that's the least believable part of all of this. A small child flying a plane through a time portal, not the time portal itself or the Continental Drift, just no unsupported skill sets they need to be addressed both planes recover and pull out of their dive and they descend below the clouds jürgen spots sicily and doubts be damned he believes based on no evidence at all that it actually is 1939 after all and he's won he says yesterday belongs to us dr jones which i'm sure is a deliberate inversion of cabaret's tomorrow belongs to me and if so it's by far the most artful reference in the entire film that's a much better film you should go and watch Cabaret. Indy, though, looks out of the window and he sees red sails and triremes. And by now, the Nazi bomber is flying so incredibly low for no very good reason that we and Jürgen see all of it very clearly. They're not in 1939. They're back in ancient times. Who could possibly have seen that coming? The bomber spends a good long while flying beneath catapult and ballistae bolts, which you'd think might have alarmed them. There is absolutely no reason for them to be flying this low, except that if they weren't flying this low, some crack shot Greek or Roman couldn't bullseye the plane's engine, which I think prevents it from rising like it should have done to begin with, which is important because if it had done what it should have done to begin with, there'd be nothing to stop them turning around and going back through the portal. Though if that is the reason they don't increase their altitude again, they don't know it yet because they suggest doing it again a bit later. We cut away then to a bearded man in a tower in Syracuse who lives in something vaguely resembling a lab so of course this must be Archimedes himself. We see him looking at his almost complete dial, we see him making calculations, which presumably means he knows where these people have come from. It doesn't yet have any little dial thing in the middle of it, it's not a complete dial. That happens later, except that it must also happen before because time travel. But at this point, you know, does he, can he know that the dial he's making will work without the dial thing in the middle that he doesn't yet know about or the watch he hasn't yet seen because he hasn't yet finished the dial? Like, what was his original plan to get it to work? What was supposed to be in the middle of the dial before he knew about watches and other little things? Like, he gets, oh no, fuck it, we'll get there later. Outside, we see proof of Archimedes' inventions, the sea claws and later the heat focusing array. That's nice enough, don't mind it too much. Not entirely sure what the point and purpose of this long sea wall is though, but never the fuck mind. Another ballista bolt hits the Nazi bomber, and for some fucking reason, Boyd decides that shooting at Roman soldiers on ships is by far the most sensible course of action. This guy's busy killing all the Roman soldiers, I guess. At one point, he just fucking breaks the cockpit window <laughs> and starts shooting out of that one. Shooting too, yeah. And then he gets on the minigun. He gets on the minigun and starts shooting. Or one of them does. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so like, good. What are you guys in the what bad are you way. doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Like some, somewhere in his head, the question asked is, why am I shooting Romans? Because I want to save Hitler. And it's just... Uh... <laughs> That's the best summary of this action scene. We have to kill the Romans to protect Hitler. <laughs> Indy asks them what the fuck they think they're doing, which is a very sensible question. Because really, yeah, what the fuck is going on here? Why are you just flying around in ballista range, firing pistols at Romans? Ballistas aren't designed to hit flying objects. They weren't even that accurate against ground-based objects. Just, just fly out of range, you absolute morons. Indy then tells Jürgen that they have to turn around. Now, as mentioned, I'd assumed that they couldn't do that anymore because one of the engines has been hit. Because if they could still do it, why is Indy the one introducing this idea now? Why haven't they decided to do that already? Why haven't they done it right away? Why haven't they even tried to do it before now? Disobeying the advice of his aides, Archimedes, meanwhile, decides the best thing to do is to get a horse and ride out of the city. While on one of the triremes, a Roman soldier who the film seems to want to convey as very important, looks up at the planes 
planes flying overhead and concludes that they are dragons and must be killed. This is what that puppet show earlier was paying forward to, so you can see I hope why I quite liked the mechanic they chose to foreshadow this, but why I absolutely detest the thing it was in fact foreshadowing, because really this is just, this is just absurd. This is something else. Why is it that we know about the Siege of Syracuse, by the way? Why is it that we know anything at all about the Romans? Well, might have something to do with the fact that the Romans were excellent record keepers. What was entirely absent from Indy's lecture on this very battle at the beginning of the film? Mention of dragons. What was absent from the entire historical record of this battle? Also mention of dragons. What did the Romans notably not get around to doing before they were wiped out of existence? Well, reverse engineering machine guns and internal combustion engines and such. Yes, yes, I am familiar with Arthur Clarke's line that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, but that line does have its limits. If these planes had simply disappeared back into the portal later, or if they'd crashed into the ocean and become irretrievable, then yes, but one of these planes is about to crash onto the beach outside Syracuse itself, where it remains, apparently, forevermore. The Romans were voracious students of technology. They were good at taking strange foreign items and finding new uses for them. And believably, large bits of this plane would have remained intact. Guns, for example. A Roman who picks up a gun later and plays around with it and accidentally manages to fire it begins to learn its basic function. He learns the association between the trigger and the bullet, which further study would then begin to explain. I slightly know the author Helen Dale, who's written a series of alt history books premised on the question, what if the Romans had an industrial revolution? I don't think this is quite the kind of thing she had in mind. So once you're done watching Cabaret, go read those books. They're also better than this film. On the bomber, Jürgen starts panicking and demanding that it be turned around, but the pilots are a bit shit. So he gets mad and he starts grabbing at the controls. And then, from absolutely fucking nowhere, because at this point they're over the inner city, another ballista bolt hits the plane and takes out the pilot. Oh god. Ugh. Someone give that soldier a medal, whoever the fuck he is. Expert marksman. Absolutely top shooting there. Helena chooses this moment to reveal herself and is accosted by a couple of spare Nazis who've just been sitting around in the back of the plane waiting for their cue. She opens the bomb bay doors and they fall out, though one of them clings on desperately. She doesn't help him. She says, Sorry pal, you're a Nazi. Oh, God. Boyd, meanwhile, has decided that merely shooting at Romans with a pistol isn't enough, so he grabs a whole ass fucking machine gun and unloads on the ships underneath him, calling them savages. It's honestly, it's the funniest thing in the film. This is not a serious person, this is clown behaviour. Nazi clown behaviour. Helena almost falls through the Bombay doors herself, but Indy has in this moment forgotten that he's been shot recently, so he helps her up. The plane gets hit by a giant flaming rock from a catapult, and look how high they are at this point, but for some reason it doesn't immediately crash or explode. Indy grabs a parachute, Jürgen tries to get it off him, Helena shoots Jürgen, Indy and Helena parachute down toward the city from much higher than they've ever been shown being before, while the bomber goes crashing down to the beach, Boyd still shooting all the way down. Then there's an explosion. The parachute lands, Tall Square insists the pilot dude that they land and help their friends. The very important Roman, meanwhile, spots the parachute dropping out of the sky and thinks that's definitely something he needs to kill. Archimedes goes rummaging through the wreck of the bomber, he finds Jürgen's corpse and he steals his watch. He also finds the completed Dial of Destiny. And if that's survives, then plenty else has as well. Not Jürgen, though. Jürgen is dead, by the way. That's that's it. He's a, he's a dead now. That was his end. Flopped out of the cockpit of his crashed plane, waiting for some Greek guy to steal his valuables. What a spectacularly incompetent villain he was. Anyway, Archimedes picks up the dial and says that the one thing he has to say, because it's what the writers remember from fourth grade, Eureka. Then he goes for a jog, followed by a couple of armed peasants, to meet up with Indy and Helena. Indy has by now remembered that he's been shot, and he's finally starting to feel the effects of it. Again, half an hour after it happened. He looks around him, he's awestruck, which is fair enough, you know, he's studied all of this, now he's seeing it happen in real time. And you know this is all reshoots because they're really, like, none of these people are there. I'm pretty sure they're not on any kind of location, it all looks so evidently green screen. The lighting's wrong, they look entirely out of place. I'm sure none of this was in the original script, it, none of this was meant to happen. Indy hands Helena a piece of paper with the dates on it, he says, if you reverse them, you can go home. So, oh god, really, continental drift isn't a thing, or, or it is? but it only works in one direction. What? Indy says he's going to stay. Helena tries to convince him not to for the sensible reason that he will fuck up history if he does, as though they haven't already done that by, you know, crashing Nazi warplanes into it. And also as though Indy himself doesn't already know that he doesn't stay because he's never read about himself in the past and I fucking hate time travel. My god. Vaguely important, Roman emerges at this point and tries to kill them, but he's shot by one of Archimedes' peasant archers, so good -o, he's dead and we're meeting Archimedes now. That's not going to fuck up history for Further. Except, of course, that, yeah, it does, and it has to, because, as Helena explains, and as is attested by the retreat we see in the background, their presence alone has forced the Roman navy into retreat. Now, it did take the Romans a good long while to 
conquer Syracuse, but nowhere in their annals is it recorded that they were on one occasion forced to retreat by fucking dragons. And you know, I do wonder whether vaguely important Roman himself was originally meant to be the guy who kills Archimedes but now can't. Because again, Archimedes has to die very soon in this siege. He is killed by a Roman legionary disobeying orders, like this guy's just done, to take the scientist alive. That's the only vaguely important Roman involved in Archimedes' actual death. So uh, is this part of the film supposed to be suggesting that they are changing history? But then no, because there are further complications. Helena tells us that the Dial of Destiny was a forced deck, referencing that card game from earlier. It was only ever going to lead them to this precise moment. Archimedes used it to petition the future for help against the Romans. But if that's so, then, oh, fuck me. Well, in the first place, how does that work? Because the film is trying here to establish a vague kind of closed time loop. That's its chosen model of time travel. Well, is it though? It's kind of its chosen model of time travel. Everything that happens in the past always happened in the past. So if you go back in time, you can't change anything because you always went back in time and you always did what you went to do, meaning history accounts for you and you cannot change it. This is why I assume they went with Dial of Destiny as a title, because this reveal means that absolutely nothing in the film is volitional. And so they always do this. They always go back in time. So Archimedes always makes the dial, which always petitions the future for help, which always sends them back in time to answer it. So he always makes the dial, meaning of course that Indy already knows that he can't and doesn't stay, because if he did stay, he would believably never have come, meaning he was never here. So the whole thing unwinds. God. Continental Drift had nothing to do with it. Meaning then that this entire plot relies on it being really quite lucky that Jürgen forgot that Archimedes didn't know about Continental Drift, and also really quite lucky that Archimedes splitting the dial in half and hiding half of it in his super secret tomb was successful in having the dial he tried to hide from the future bring people back from the future to help no oh god and then again if all this happens because it always happens how have their huge intrusions on the historical record not potentially prohibited it from happening in the future because except with respect to the dial itself the rest of history proceeds as though none of this ever happened unless the film wants to tell us that the future they are going back to is going to be different and just kind of forgets to show that it is though if that's the case then we've broken the causality loop because we'd now be working with multiple timelines actual history up until 1969, actual future post-1969, old history up until 1969, old future after 1969, which overlap for the duration our protagonists are meddling with the past in summation. No. Moving on. Indy nevertheless persists in wanting to stay in the past because the future, which he would profoundly alter if he did stay, and might have profoundly altered already because we're not actually sure on the butterfly effect for this causal loop. It oh, fuck it. Anyway, because the future has nothing for him. He has nothing and no one to go back to. Nothing and no one to live for. So yeah, he's uh, he's relapsed. He's back to being depressed and allergic to his own existence. It's up to Helena to snap him out of it, and that's already inconvenient because that means there is no way Indiana Jones has much agency at all in his own adventure. The least damaging way forward from this point would be for her to remind him that he does have something to live for, that he loves and values history too much to tamper with it. Because that's the sort of thing the Nazis did, remember? And he doesn't like them. That this adventure proves he's still got it. That he's battled the Nazis again, he saved the world, he's recovered his old self and Marion still exists, he still has a chance with her, etc. Make him realise all of this. Again, it's not ideal because he would have to be made to realise all of it, but at least he would come to the final realisation himself. That, though, is not what happens. In the version we get, Indy has no agency at all because he insists on staying. He says, I need to do this. He puts on his hat, his theme plays, this is his decision, it seems like he's going to get his way, and then Helena says, so do I, and she twats him in the face and knocks him out and he wakes up in the future you're wondering what the fuck just happened. Which is just plain pathetic. If there were one scintilla of doubt remaining about whose film this is, that is now gone. This is Helena Shaw and the Dial of Destiny. She does everything. She figures everything out. She does the fighting. She saves Indy against his will. And he's a passenger. He's dragged around semi-consciously at best. And now, in this pivotal moment, the climax of the film, he is dragged around unconsciously. He's just gone. He's not here. There's no point. What a fucking film. But, well, like, because grudgingly I'll say one nice thing for the scene, it's fairly well performed, even by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She doesn't have to be the insufferably chirpy, witty, weightless irritant that she is throughout the film, she just, well she just was. And my god, we're still not done, god damn it. Indy wakes up back in the future, or the present, whatever you will. Helena is there because of course she is. He has a moan, he says she should have let him stay. She says, no, because he'd have changed the course of history. Much like they didn't when they flew planes into history. They've already 9-11'd 
history. What the fuck is she on about? She says he's meant to be here. He says, oh. And it turns out that Helen has fixed this problem for him as well. Because in walk, Tall Square and Marion. Indy asks her what she's doing here. She says, someone told me you were back. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right. Well, what does this say about her? What does it say about him? What does it say about everyone he knows? According to this telling, Indy got depressed and so Marion Upton left him. She's only come back now because someone, read Helena, has told her that Indy is back, which makes Marion a bit of a bitch, doesn't it? She's only prepared to be here if he's already good enough for her, but she's not prepared to stick around and help him through his depression? According to this telling, Indy is an idiot. His whole reason for not calling Marion earlier is that she wouldn't want to speak to him, and that's what makes him depressed. Except that all he'd have had to do was pretend not to be depressed for five minutes, give her a call, she'd come back, thus curing his depression, thus meaning that he wouldn't have so much of a motive to want to stay in the past at all. And it makes all the people around him, Salah first and foremost, seem distant and careless with their friendship, because we now have to believe that no one he knows, none of his friends, saw him in this state, understood the cause of it, and spoke to Marion on his behalf. They just let him spiral downward towards something quite close to suicide. Lovely friends they are. And uh, yeah, speaking of Salah, he's back for no real reason. He wanders in with his kids. He says hello. Eleanor suggests they all go and get ice cream, and he wanders out again. <laughs> That's kind of it. Indy and Marion play the elbow kiss from Raiders in Reverse. That's, well, charming-ish. Shame about everything else. The camera pans to the rest of the troop in the street going off for their ice cream. It then pans up to the balcony where Indy's hat is hanging. We see him grab the hat, and that's it. That's the end. Hundreds of millions of dollars, quite possibly hundreds of millions of reshoots, and that is the best they could do. That is the last we'll see of Indiana Jones. What a fucking waste. I'm not going to do a lengthy summation for this film because, frankly, we've all been here long enough. It's late. The sun's going down. There's just a few hours left until bedtime. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is appalling. If you look at it without thinking, if you squint, if you listen really hard, you spot one or two familiar superficialities. The hat. The whip. Is that is that John Williams I hear? Oh look, it's Harrison Ford. And uh, there the similarities with Indiana Jones kind of end. The film proper opens with Indy wanting to die, which really means he's already dead. Once again, a much-loved hero has had to be taken apart in order to justify a story that didn't need to be told and that barely deserves the name. It's not a story, really. It's a series of random events that are loosely connected when they're connected at all. Four or five different plots have been smushed together and the seams have been incompetently covered up with a green screen. Not only does Indy have no moral agency in the film, not only does he have no physical agency, not only does he have no intellectual agency because all these things belong to Helena Shaw, he has no cosmic agency either because he was always going to do what he did in this film. That's why he's doing it. Ain't time travel wonderful? Once again, that torn down hero has been shunted aside, hobbled, kneecapped, put on wheels and then dragged back onto the stage by the new female hero, who lacks a tenth of the charm of the genuine female heroes of earlier installments. Arguably, Indy's destruction in this film is worse than Luke's in The Last Jedi, because there at least Luke eventually realises he doesn't have to be a grumpy old hermit, at least he chooses to pointlessly kill himself by projecting across the galaxy to save the rebellion from the Empire, I mean the resistance from the First Order. His destruction there was much more shocking than Indy's is here, because it was the first major instance of what has now become a trend. While Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is what you might call a symptom of late-stage nihilism. The shocking has become a trope and now a meme. It's no longer shocking. But if you ignore the meta and you simply compare the two films like for like, Luke takes baby steps to rebuild his own wrecked character, while here, Indy takes none. He has to be knocked out and dragged to the end, literally. To call him a passenger isn't anything like strong enough. He's a burden in his own film whenever he's not an irrelevance. An old guy who has to be carted from place to place by younger, fitter, happier people who most of the time kind of begrudge his presence. I've tried to steer clear of the it didn't need to be made line because plenty of good things didn't need to be made. Raiders of the Lost Ark was an unexpected success. No one was clamoring for the creation of Indiana Jones. But this needless film wasn't just unlooked for, it was unwanted. In fact, no, it wasn't just unwanted. By some people, at least it was dreaded. And yet it still exists. They did it anyway. They did it anyway. They spent the budget of a small, no, in fact, a medium-sized African country to bring it to the screen. And the result isn't just an irrelevance, it's not just an irritant in the way Crystal Skull felt a bit like sandpapering your own balls, it was destructive. With Crystal Skull, you can lament the incompetence on display. You can go without it, you can hold it in vague disdain, but when you're forced to look at it, at least Indy himself isn't entirely wrecked. At least he still has his wits and his nous and his knowledge and some of his charm and his strength. But with Dart of Destiny, you have to avoid this film. You have to quite deliberately myth-make that it does not exist. Because 
to even acknowledge it, you accept that Indy is not Indy anymore. It's like the Ark of the Covenant. You look at it and your face melts. Whatever happens, don't open your eyes. Like the Ark, and to use the inevitable pun, Indiana Jones belongs in a museum. There is no positive utility to wheeling him out for this laughable mess of an adventure. He should be preserved in a climate-controlled glass box displayed as close as may be to his prime for future generations to look at and say, you know what? The past was a pretty wonderful place. I wonder how we can do the same thing. I wonder how we can look at that and be inspired and make something for ourselves. Relics belong in museums because you only get one chance at history. You can't recreate it. Beyond a certain point, attempts to repurpose it can only damage the original artifact until you've fixed and mended and tweaked and replaced so many bits of it that nothing of the original thing remains. It is, at that point, lost to history. Its present day form is something else entirely. So maybe, just perhaps, can we can we leave Indy alone now? Don't bring him back. Don't DH him again. Don't use him as a cameo. Don't recast him. Don't try to add to what's already complete. Flick that little switch in your mind. Preserve don't renovate. Indy has had his last crusade. There is one last thing that I really do have to say. That is, congratulations, Kathy. When you became president of Lucasfilm in 2012, the company wasn't in the best shape, but at least it had a shape. The Star Wars prequels and Crystal Skull had maybe wiped some of the sheen off the studio's marquee properties, but by and large, the Lucasfilm legacy remained intact. <laughs> and, and what a legacy. There's a reason Disney splurged so much money to acquire it. Four billion dollars is quite the sum. I wonder, I wonder what it would fetch now. Like, some degenerative condition, your peculiar brand of mismanagement, Kathy dear, has spread from the head down. It takes some doing to make Star Wars lose money, but you managed it. One of the biggest, if not the biggest movie franchises of all time has been left a clapped out brainless husk. All the old heroes are dead. No one has emerged to take their place. We have no idea where we're going. We don't even know if we want to go anywhere. Then from the head, it spreads to the non-vital appendages, the ones we never really notice, but we'd rather have them than not. The odd finger, the appendix, Willow. Willow was a small but beloved cult classic, and under your stewardship, Kathy, it was warped into something that Disney couldn't even be bothered to stream. National Treasure Edge of History is still on Disney+. Plus. The Willow Show is not. That tells you something about how awful that show was. And now, left unchecked, Kathy, your disease has spread to the remaining organs. Indiana Jones and the Diary of whatever the fuck that was is on course to be a near record-setting July 4th flop. Like all good parasites, Kathy, you are the last thing standing. There's nothing left to ruin, as is the inevitable fate of all parasites. You probably won't long outlast the death of the host, though. The odds of your contract being removed once it expires next year are, I think I would say, quite slim, though you have surprised us before. Rumors of your death have long been exaggerated, but there's only so long anyone can leech off a corpse, like a mad end-time street preacher hailing the imminent apocalypse. Doomcock will be right in the end. It just wasn't quite as imminent as he said it would be. When you sat next to George Lucas, Kathy, in that interview, and you promised that you would protect and champion his characters, the world he created. Did he know what was coming? Is that why he looked so depressed? Did you know what was coming? Is that why you seemed so gleeful and triumphant? Was this in fact the culmination of a long and deliberate campaign to sabotage someone who did you some terrible wrong in the past? Did he ask you to fetch one too many coffees? Carry one too many bags? Back when that was what you were generally considered to be good for? Is this your Palpatine-style revenge trick? I could believe it, except that that requires one very important quality you seem to lack, Kathy dear competence. You, Kathleen, have two settings, indecision and bad decision. Cinema generally is in a pretty naff state. We can overemphasize the uniqueness of the calamity that is you, Kathy. You aren't responsible for the travails of DC and Marvel. Kathleen Kennedy didn't ruin Elemental or Lightyear, The Little Mermaid, a great many of the flops and disasters of recent years. No, no, we, we can't blame you for all that. And so we shouldn't look forward to your eventual departure, either through contract expiry or death, as though your replacement will necessarily be much better. But there is a unique style of chaos that seems to follow you, Kathy darling, wherever you go. Plenty of studios, plenty of boardrooms, plenty of writers and directors have bad ideas, but your particular talent is in combining as many of these as you can into one product. The conveyor belt of directors attached to every film released under your tenure is only bested by the even longer conveyor belt of films cancelled under your tenure. An entire sex, more than half the global population, is disadvantaged by your services to women's representation, I'm afraid. The force is female, so of course it must be indecisive 
sensitive, it sends mixed messages, never really knows what it wants. Only under KK can the directors of the Lego Movie and Ron Howard lead the same damned film. Way to live down to the stereotype. Maybe you did have talent once upon a time. Maybe there's something you're good for. Your record as a producer is certainly creditable, Kathy. ILM and Skywalker Sound seem to be in pretty rude health, and you have our thanks for that. But producing a film and helming a studio are two very different things. Helping people realize their vision is a worthy endeavor, but it does not entail a vision of your own. Incoherent meddling and the obsession with staying current precludes the possibility of permanence. Even in the Star Wars prequels, George Lucas wanted to sieve out the timeless from timely politics. He wanted to look at how republics fail and how empires rise. While under your stewardship, the question foremost in the Lucasfilm mind seems to have been, how many women can we put in this film? And which timeless heroes will we reduce to accomplish it? In few other industries, could such a sterling record of abject failure be tolerated? Maybe in the early days, stupidity could explain why but TLJ made money, and but Charles made money, was deemed an acceptable defense of your record, Kathy, even though sensible people spotted that they made significantly less money each time. But taking some of the biggest franchises from mere declining profits to actual losses isn't unlike taking a championship winning team to relegation in the space of a single season. PSG fancy themselves a rich and successful football club. They sack their managers for only winning the domestic league. So, um, wherefore art thou, Kathy dear? And for how much longer? Institution blindness and inertia goes some distance, but it only goes so far. Your utility as prominent woman probably bought you more leniency in the silly money decade of the 2010s, and then the temporary streaming boom of the COVID lockdown era was at best a useful distraction, and in reality something more like a spell cast over the money-hungry eyes at Disney. Never underestimate the stupidity and short-sightedness of big business when the books are painted black. But now things are looking a bit more ballard than beautiful. Luxury beliefs and high-status frivolity are looking like distinctly unaffordable indulgences. Never underestimate the good sense and ruthlessness of big business when the black paint washes away to red. Look how many women we employ is, in the final analysis, the kind of thing you boast of only when your profits are inflated for other reasons. Diversity does not make money. And now the parks are struggling. And now the films are bombing. And now competitors are showing how easy it is to make money with much-loved properties so long as your priority is entertainment rather than political fads. And so long as writers and directors are allowed to actually finish the work they start without the dreaded words creative difference appearing in news reports, minds above yours, Kathy, should be starting to focus. Luxury brands are, after all, much better for the bottom line than luxury hires are. If the company has any sense, and sense and money do tend to be inversely correlated, you will not be around to do again what you've already done, my dear. Sure, we'll have to watch the acolyte bomb. That's too far along to stop. And by the way, ooh, what a choice that was. The phrases services to women and services to Harvey Weinstein very seldom go together without the name Leslie Headland attached to them. The force is female indeed. But of the rest, the Ray movie, Filoni wrapping up Disney Plus shows fewer and fewer people watch, Tyker's film? Well, they're marginally more likely to happen than Phoebe Waller Bridge helming a future Indiana Jones franchise because that's currently lying in a ditch. But on balance, I would be surprised if we saw many of these, if we saw any of them at all. And I would be very surprised if you, Kathy, were in place to oversee them. Relying on Disney to be sensible is, of course, a risky proposition, but behaviors are influenced by the outside, and the big studios are long lived for a reason. It takes repetition for them to remember they've been through all this before, kind of like a bullshit Indiana Jones time travel mechanic, but those that remember will survive. So it's right now that I think we move our attention away from Kathy. sorry, just, just go away now, because as mentioned, she adds her own flavor to a much broader issue. It's not only Kathy's projects that fail, though they so reliably do, it's so many studios that indulge their own Kathys, that hire the wrong people, that keep them longer than they should, that pursue current things over artistic ones. Money tends to speak. 2022 was the worst year in terms of box office receipts since 1998. Some of that is due to the declining box office take from the MCU. Though looked at another way, that means the MCU has been effectively masking a longer decline in the general box office. It accounted for almost a third of the entire take in 2021. And even the other heavy lifting blockbusters that make up much of the rest of the slack, Jurassic World and Avatar for example, aren't exactly regarded as high quality films. The impact of streaming services on the cinema was probably overstated it in the first years of this decade, but it shouldn't be understated either. Even if their early promise hasn't been fulfilled, because, shockingly, their lockdown-era growth was unsustainable, they do compete with cinema, albeit not quite in the way that the rise of TV competed with the movie industry of the 1950s. Because a great many movie studios own the streaming services, big screen content reliably appears on the small screen in short order. Streaming services provide more content per buck than the cinema, a function of rising ticket prices. You can get a month of Disney Plus for the same price as a single movie ticket. And when Disney content inevitably ends up on 
OnePlus anyway, a great many people will be content to wait. This creates something of a cycle, since poor films that underperform at the box office appear on streaming services more quickly than successful films do, meaning more people wait on the streaming release, meaning more movies underperform. And so it goes. In response to which, as has happened before, movie studios push the boundaries of excess. They try to outcompete the small screen on spectacle, on budget and technology, and it does lead to some very real improvements and advancements. The volume screen might be overused, but it is a technological accomplishment. But very few of these actually restore the studio's fortunes. Hollywood went through an incredibly similar dilemma in the 1940s and 50s. Losing their audience to TV, they doubled down on epics, on spectacular visuals, on musicals, on the kind of big-budget technological feats that TV could not replicate. Once again, real technological advancements were made, technicolor and such. And once again, the studio's fortunes were not reversed. The studio system itself suffered some significant blows, some companies went bust, the viewership continued to decline, as the remaining studios struggled to find new ways to recapture an audience transformed by demographic change. But pandering to them didn't work either. In the end, old Hollywood had to be brought to its deathbed before the Hollywood renaissance could occur. It was only after the studios had exhausted their budgets on big, spectacular epics that the savvier studios decided, well, fuck it, what have we got to lose? Let's take a risk. Out with the old, in with the new. We'll hire newer, younger writers, newer, younger directors. We'll trust that these artists can convey their visions more effectively than we can. We in our business suits, our tobacco-stained fingers. The proper response to change is change, after all. The definition of of madness is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It was because of this new and frankly quite desperate mindset that Spielberg got his start in cinema, and likewise George Lucas. Indiana Jones was a love letter to a bygone era because that era was gone, and its creators used their fame, power, and influence to pay tribute to it. Fame, power, and influence they only gained because that era was gone, because the studios took a chance on them when they were starting out. The cinematic revival of the 70s and the 80s eventually recreated something very like the old studio system. The era of corporate Hollywood that now suffers from the same creative and intellectual bankruptcy as the old order did. Because history repeats itself, there are few genuinely new things under the sun. While Raiders of the Lost Ark was a love letter to an older age, Dial of Destiny more closely resembles the type of film that killed the old age off. It trades equally off its spectacle and its pandering to a disappearing audience. The absolute best that can be said of the result is that it is, well, superficial, and that is the absolute best that can be said of it. People don't really want that, though. Ultimately, we all like having meaning in our stories. We all like having stories to begin with. We would rather have something new than a rehashed version of something recognizable. In the short term, I think we can expect more of the same. More bombs, more soulless epics with comically inept writing, more destroyed franchises, more political posturing and attempts to lure in my fellow youths. The medium term will be a decidedly mixed bag, fewer giant budget blockbusters, more of the hundred million dollar range, some of which will turn a profit, many of which will not. But in the longer term, once all the dead wood is swept away, we might, just might, have something new, something more alive, some new story, some new franchises, new reasons to go back to the consolidated cinemas. We can still watch the old things in their museums, but the fact they're in museums allows the new things to come to life. And then, yeah, it'll all happen again. But uh, that at least is it for this. This won't happen again. I'm done with this film, never touching it again for the rest of my life. So uh, at least there's that to be said for it. See you in the next video, folks.